A gift's cringe. I have been told that gifts well, I have been are told for older that they people. Are actually, I have heard that. I have. I'm like, mm, I think there's like there's good gifts and there's bad gifts though, because a lot of gifts can be cringe because they're like, well, we've seen that gift many times now. It's time to get some more gifts than just office gifts. But you know, there's only so many times we can see stew. They are cringe. Yeah, that's the thing. So I, I feel like short answer no, but long answer often yes. That's my sense. Listen, if Discord is still going to have it like integrated, I'm just still going to send people gifts in my, you know, in my inner circle. But yep. the thing is, is that Discord now has, I think Discord is moving on from gifts to soundboards, which are way funnier. Because sometimes- Like, are I- we talking like the Arnold Schwarzenegger one back in the day where you could like make yourself- Yes. <laughs> but like, you can have Who that- Who is your daddy and what <laughs> does he do? You can have that in Discord that now. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes sometimes i'll be on a discord call with someone and they'll tell a joke and i'll do the polite golf clap like <laughs> okay and it's, well, it's a sound is it is you know, it actually a but sound you can, you can put your own sounds in too oh so I we've see. got some okay. with um tam obviously put in the snake eater theme we've got nice. like a bunch of stuff in there so i feel like gifts are out soundboards are in <sighs> I don't feel qualified to make that call. I feel like I'm over an age bracket where I'm allowed to decide what is in and what is out. So um, I'll leave that to you guys. That's fine. That was very um, Grandpa I'm, Simpson I'm also, of you. I'm also not on TikTok, so I feel like I'm well and truly disconnected from- um, You're also twice you know. our age. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm 38. That's right. <laughs> well, that makes me fucking what? <laughs> 70. 70-year-old Ralph right here, ladies and gentlemen. everyone and welcome to an episode of old friends Uh, (laughs) (laughs) where we whine about the internet (laughs) and these kids in their video games that's right and they're they're, they got no attention span anymore i mean seriously i don't have attention span anymore but i've got enough attention span to talk to you fine folks about some video games uh i'm lucy and of course every week we've got ralph love how you just waved for all your listeners, he waved. That's right. He no, waved. I did a click sound. <laughs> did I did this click. one. I did this. Google, oh, Google. Google. There you go. Yeah, Google me. <laughs> the mic, the mic doesn't count. Does it? Oh, it doesn't? Not okay, here, right. No, 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 no. Okay. And uh, Jake Baldino. Right. Hello. Oh. How are you? I am uh, I have bangs now. Yeah. You look fantastic with your bangs. You yeah, thank you. Well, I'm letting my hair down. Yeah, Enough of right. like the freaking, the big thing I do with the blow dryer and everything. I'm just, yeah. I'm letting it down. I'm relaxing. Ralph, so, you, you were away earlier whole... and Ralph was like, Lucy, your hair is much curlier today. And I noticed that your mm. hair is also much curlier today, Jake. Curly so. gang. It's curly us. gang. Yep. Rise up. I had to use curly cream <laughs> for it, though. Uh, but anyway, hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Friends for Second. Uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks for video It's a, games. It's a packed one. We are, we are s- friends per second. We got like a rotating chair this week because there's so much stuff that has happened. We got three friends in this episode. We have. We do. We got because uh, we're going to be talking about suicide. No, first of all, we're talking about Xbox because mm-hmm. that's a whole thing. Cool. Uh, and we're lucky to be joined by with uh, by Paris. Lucky to be joined. Um, Paris is joining us. Let's rephrase <laughs> that. Uh, he's joining us for that, and um, that was a really good chat. We've already pre-recorded. Yep. Um, and then we have Greg Miller who joins us for a chat about Suicide Squad. Mm-hmm. And then we also uh, spoke to the co-founder of Keen Games. Uh, his name is Anthony. Damn it, it's a Greek name. I can't remember it now. Damn it, I was so proud of myself that you I pronounced, pronounced it correctly when we did the yeah. interview. That's right. Um, anyway, Anthony, and he is the the, the lead, uh, like creative lead on Enshrouded. Mm. We had a really great chat with him. So yeah, it's a pretty stacked show reflecting a pretty stacked week mm-hmm. in the world of video games because it's all Fortnite, really. It's, it's been yeah. weird every two weeks. Yeah. So um, um, so yeah, did you guys, have you guys been doing anything else other than consuming video games this past two weeks? No, dude. It's Just been, that. no, I genuinely, like, I drove up to, I'll talk about it in show and tell, but I went for an evening away with my friends, like, we drove up to Sacramento, we went to see a musical, and then I came straight back and I played Suicide Squad for two straight days. Yeah, it is like that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It is like, well, that's what, Fe- well, Fe- we're in February now, and we always knew this was coming. We looked at the release schedule, and we're like, yeah, shit's pretty wild in February, and sure enough, it's very mm-hmm. wild in February, and, um, yeah, but I am so far, I'm, I'm keeping up, you know, it's... Yeah. It's been okay. I mean, I had a really nice break during January, and so I came back feeling very recharged. Mm. 
and uh and there was a bit of a lull period towards the back end of jan and so now it's like hitting the road and push hard for a month or a month and a bit maybe end of march it kind of gets a bit wild again with like ronan and 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 dogma and what have you but um I'm 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 excited, man. February's February's always fun these yeah. days. It's, it's a lot, but it's fun. Yeah, I mean, for, but, uh, like we got convention season also kicking off as well. Sure. So Jake, I booked my PAX stuff today, so I will be coming to bother you. Let's uh, go. GD, GDC. I'm at Dice next week, uh, which I'm very excited about. But and also, you know, thank God for the Steam Deck and Hell yeah, Rock Ally, greatest console ever made. Mm-hmm. Still going strong. Asus strong, Rob, man. get out of here. Yeah, MSI, I look, I look, Talon, be, or Claw, to get be out fair, of here. To be fair, the ROG is a good machine. No, it I, is. I, I know. It is. It's a great machine. Steam De- I have like I some have... Steam Deck supremacy. Yeah, I tried. Like, I got the... this. I haven't. I don't know if I've shown this. The Lenovo here, Legion. The, the, the Legion Go. Which I'll one's that? That's the well, Switch you'll know when you oh. see it. It's the giant one. It's like Good yeah, huge. Lord. Listen, I have a massive head, mind you. Like my head is huge. Yeah, it's it's and big. You do, it's yeah. bigger than me, you know, to the point where I'm like, I don't like using this very much. And the, the whole detachable but hand thing is not great. Yeah, they don't feel I don't great. know, man. I, it's so heavy. It's like, look, there is a place for like a really big screen and that's nice and all. But I don't know, man. I'm always just going back to my Steam Deck. Steam Deck is just the pinnacle. I love it. It's incredible. It's perfect. So yeah. Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> Hashtag not sponsored. Valve don't do any sponsorships. Okay, uh, hey, they say so they don't need to. They're like, listen, we have the market corner. We don't need you people. Uh, but yes, no, I'm just I'm just chill on the Steam Deck for free. I'll Hell do that yeah. anytime. Uh, how do mm. I how do I gracious how do I elegantly move us on? I I don't just think just like I this. Can. <laughs> just like this. Just exactly. You're nailing it. You're crushing it. Speaking of <laughs> cons. Oh. Yeah, Seuss Rog Ally, they have a they have a partnership with, with Microsoft. Microsoft. Um, there we go. Nailed it. Uh, obviously a lot of stuff is happening right now with regard to Xbox potentially moving into a multi-platform strategy. We thought it's only fair we should get uh, one of our good friends and Xbox expert Paris Lilly from Game and Tag Radio and the Kind of Funny Xcast on to talk about it. I mentioned it. We've already recorded this chat. I mentioned it there. We're recording this on Tuesday. Stuff's probably going to go bananas in between now and the episode going up. So if we say anything that gets proven otherwise, then you can't yell at us because we warned you. But we had a really good chat about what this could mean for the future of Xbox and the reaction that there has been so far, which has been wild. Here we go. Quiet, quiet week for Xbox news. Not much happening. Not much. Oh. Pretty small. Uh, so mention it. Uh, obviously, we're joined by Paris. Thank you so much for ha- uh, for having us, for being... Now, I'm going to read you all this. Jesus Yeah, Christ. thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Allow myself to introduce Paris. myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? I just, I just keep rolling. Is, it's uh, fine. Cousin Greg, cousin Greg hosting the Friends by Second podcast. <laughs> I mean, hey, to be fair, Phil's, Phil's tweet was very much like a, we're here. We're here for you. We're, we're here listening. For you. That's right. Um, That's right. So if you have been uh, not really paying attention to gaming news, uh, and for context, we are recording this on Tuesday. God knows what's going to happen between now and the episode going up. Uh, we uh, have just come out of the weekend where, let's just say Xbox has kind of broken the internet a little <sighs> bit. So The Verge posted an article that suggested that the upcoming Machine Games Indiana Jones game would be coming to PlayStation. Uh, a short period of exclusivity on Xbox and then coming to PlayStation, multiple other reports. So there was that data mine on Hi-Fi Rush, um, if you didn't see this, that they found uh, stuff in the game that there would be t-shirts that Chai would wear. And one of them was like, surprise drop. And the other one is, I'm here too, or something, you know, like in, in Switch. They're actually really cool, yeah. by the way. I like them. They're actually nice. I really, I really <laughs> think they're cute, especially like the surprise yeah. drop one uh, yeah. in PlayStation and Switch colors. And uh, then another website, Xbox Era, reported that Starfield is going to be coming to PlayStation after the uh, the next big update. Fair to say, people started freaking out. Phil Spencer tweeted, we're listening and we hear you. We've been planning a business update event for next week where we look forward to sharing more details about with you about our vision for the future of Xbox. Stay tuned. Uh, so basically, yeah, people are freaking out that Xbox might be moving towards a multi-platform strategy. Well... Don't forget, because you missed one actually. Oh, I did. Um, yeah, because um, Jeff Grubb, the man himself, 
is report <laughs> Jeff Grubb is yeah that's right my colleague who uh what he is reporting Gears of War is also under consideration and oh. he seems very confident about that so like that is a big one because yeah. it's like it doesn't get any more Xbox than Gears of War I mean Starfield's a bit of a Johnny yeah. come lately Halo you know we're like yeah I mean Halo obviously yeah. sure but you're right it, it, but like it's it's in terms of core brands. Mm-hmm. It's basically like just Halo and Gears of War that are just inseparable from that brand, mm-hmm. you know? And the idea that they would end up on other platforms is pretty wild. So like I said, just so we don't get burned in case something comes up, <laughs> we're recording yes. this on Tuesday. If stuff happens that we don't mention here, that is why. We're sorry. Um, but I mean, let's let's get initial thoughts, guys. What do you think about Xbox first party games coming? To other platforms paris i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to you first mate yeah for me it's not a surprise when the initial rumors came out about things like hi-fi rush or starfield um i'd commented on at, at the time saying hey i get it these aren't the games that are going to get you to go buy an xbox right so yeah we, they already have shown in the past with things like uh, minecraft dungeons or ori that they're willing to put games on other platforms but it's to the point of these, the Jeff Grubbs of the worlds and the Tom Warrens of the world, when they started saying things like Gears of War and Halo potentially going, that raises an eyebrow because I think Halo's your flagship. There is no Xbox without Halo. So if Halo were to now start showing up on your competitor's platform, I think you start losing some of your identity as being an Xbox. So but I can just to, sure. sorry, just to interrupt you, there's no. I haven't heard any rumors that Halo is under consideration. Master Chief Collection. That's what I saw. Really? Oh. Yeah. Who, okay, who, who was reporting that? <laughs> There's been so many. Someone. I can't even it's keep out there. track. Okay. But even, let's All just right. say it's Gears. Let's, let's just go with that one. Sure. Even sure. if it's sure. Gears, you start losing some of your identity because these are your flagship titles. These are a reason that you would want to go jump into an Xbox ecosystem. So, <clears throat> excuse me. That's where it started raising the alarms of, all right, what are they doing? Are they going full third party? Are they going to start make, stop making hardware, things like that? So it just raises a bunch of questions. But I think even the phrasing that we're seeing sticking with gears, like Grubb saying it's under consideration, it would not shock me at all that internally they're talking about it. But are they actually going to execute execute something like that? <clears throat> Excuse me. That would be surprising to me. I could see the scenario again that your Xbox game studio games stay on it in the Xbox ecosystem. Bethesda and Activision, you continue to treat them as, as basically third party publishers, but obviously you own them now and you get the revenue from them. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my opinion on all this has been, let's just wait. Let's just wait until they uh-huh. officially say something. I think when you had so many media sites starting to talk about this over the weekend, Phil Spencer had to acknowledge it. Mm-hmm. So that's why we saw the tweet that we did. But I would rather wait till next week and they actually officially say what they're going to do because plans change all the time. They could literally be deciding what to do until the very last minute versus what we've obviously seen here over the past few days. People thinking everything's going. I personally don't think that's the case. But we'll see next week. Yeah, I'm curious mm. to see what a what did he call it a business update event? What right. that yeah. actually looks like? What does that mean? Is there going to be a nice live stream presentation where Sarah Bond comes out and says, "Hey, gamers, we're putting Starfield on PS5"? Like, I don't know <laughs> Dude, what is actually going I, to be. Business update this event has the same corporate speak to me as company update. Yeah, that's like, right. I saw these these I saw these Reddit threads that are like it feels like it feels like I'm about to get laid yeah, off as yeah, an Xbox fan. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And like and I mean, don't forget, like we're coming off the heels of nineteen hundred people yeah, leaving yeah, yeah. like getting laid off and, and losing their jobs from the Xbox org. One team in particular that was hit is the physical uh game side of things. Yeah. You gotta wonder if that if this wasn't all part of some some measures to get more money like you know if, if if physical is not doing that well and judging by the amount of sales that i've heard from friends of mine in like publishing and dev and how what the split is between physical on xbox and playstation then yeah they're kind of i don't know hedging their bets in other places it yeah. seems like yeah i mean yeah like it's and it 
because obviously we don't know, of course. We don't know what's going to happen, right? But it's almost inevitable that some Xbox stuff is going to make us... Because yeah. we already kind of know about, like, what do you call it? With um, Hi-Fi Rush, it's already kind of been rated. And I think Sea of Thieves might have also been rated in other territories as well, like by ratings boards or whatever. So that's almost certain. There's also the other stuff where it's like, it's highly likely that Xbox is thinking about this because if they're going to do a business update, they're not doing a business update just to announce they're bringing Hi-Fi Rush to the Switch. I'm sorry, but that's not happening, you know? So... It's like, okay, we're going that direction. Certainly some of their portfolio is going to be available on other platforms. Paris, you made the point like, you know, maybe they keep some of their other stuff and they keep it exclusive, but it almost becomes a case of like, well, what's the point at that point? Mm. Like, you know, like what, what if, if you're really only keeping Halo and Gears of War, like, I'm sorry, but those brands, those things, they're essential to the Xbox brand, but they don't have the same cash and pull that they once did as exclusives, right? I think, you know, Starfield at this point seems like has more, like Elder Scrolls, okay, for example, Elder Scrolls 6, that's got a lot more pull than Halo does at this point, mm. for sure. As much as I love Halo, that's just a fact, you know? So it's almost like if you're going to go that path of putting most of your stuff on multi-platform, why wouldn't you just go the go whole hog? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and maybe, and I mean, my suspicion is probably something akin to like, they'll do Xbox first, you know, mm -hmm. and they'll say, you know, play all the best games on Xbox through Game Pass, play them first here, et cetera, et cetera. But, <laughs> um, sorry, I've got to, someone's knocking at my door. Just, just you guys keep going, keep okay, going. Okay. I got I to get it. I, gotta, well, no, I mean, to that point about Xbox first, I could see that as a strategy, but then that only really benefits, you know, we are very privileged in that we have all of the consoles, right? And it's like, right. if I wanted to play, the new gears, it's finally coming out and I have an Xbox. It's like, great, I can play it six months to a year early because I have that console. Would I purchase, if I was only a PlayStation player, would I purchase a new console for new gears if I knew it was eventually coming? No, I wouldn't. No, but and, and I think that's, that's part of the point why it's going to be interesting to see what the strategy is going to be because if I, if I already own a PlayStation and you're just telling me I need to wait a certain period of time and those games will eventually come to the PlayStation, well, why would I go buy an Xbox? I would continue to keep a PlayStation, play all the PlayStation games, and then play the Xbox games when they show up on my platform. Yeah. Or if I don't own a PlayStation or an Xbox right now and I'm looking to get a console... I'm probably going to go get a PlayStation because yeah. I only need one console at that point. I don't need multiple consoles. So whatever the strategy is going to be, the kind of halfway in, halfway out, Xbox first. I don't know. They're, they're going to need to do some great messaging around that because I, I, I think a lot of people are just going to see, well, even if you're going to continue to make make hardware, I don't need your hardware. I'll, I'll just get the competition. Mm. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, totally. that's uh, like that's another question where looking at people's tweets from the weekend, the immediate freak out is they are leaving the console hardware space. Right. I personally don't believe that for a second. I don't think so either. I think, I mean, obviously but, they, but, they sell them, they sell them at a loss, but it is part of their broader ecosystem. Game Pass brings in a ton of money. They also have like peripherals, like controllers and stuff. All of that does bring money. I can't see them at least in the short term let's say 10 years, and maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe someone will clip this and it'll bite me in the ass. I can't see Xbox leaving the console space immediately. But it's almost like, what is the point of an Xbox console without exclusive Xbox games? What is the point of any console without exclusive games? It's like an existential question about the nature of this pro this business model. Mm. And it's, it's, it's to your point as well, Paris, which is like, if I can get all of the games on, an X, on a PlayStation, but I just need to wait a bit longer, mm then I'm going to do that. Like, it just makes sense. Like, you know, yeah, you can have a hardware agnostic Xbox. You know what it's called? It's called a PC. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they already exist. And so the idea of a console is it's a thing that plays a lot of games, mm -hmm. but in particular, it plays very specific games that you can only play on that thing. I mean, that's not the technical definition of a console, no. but I'm saying in terms of how we, how we understand that, what the business model is. And so, yeah, if you abandon that pillar, it's kind of like- What's what's left on that side of the fence, on the hardware side? And that's the thing. It's not even just the hardware side. It's because are we gonna see Game Pass on PlayStation? No. Are you gonna see Game no. Pass? You're gonna see Game Pass. I doubt it. You're gonna see Game Pass on Xbox and PC. And so those are the places yep. where they have <coughs> the hold on the hardware market, at least. Especially because you know there is not a PlayStation model that is as cheap as the Series S. You know, 
for yeah, those uh, for, sure. for those gamers who does who don't necessarily want to go both feet in, but want to still be able to play games, um, who don't want to have to spend thousands on a PC. I still think I could see them yeah. slowly over time, eventually walking away from consoles, just because I think they have kind of done things differently. They've thought about things a little bit differently. Game Pass is an interesting thing. I mean, as news talky people, we've been talking about it for years just because it's mm. different. It's unconventional to the other things, the other platform and software people do. So I I just I if there was like a that whiff of them leaving the console space, I was like, oh, it makes sense in my brain only from the fact that they've kind of approached things differently for a while now. And, mm. you know, with them talking about how uh, Phil Spencer acknowledging that they are like third place in the console war type yeah. thing. Mm. Right. I do feel like there is going to be a point where they do start radically shifting their thinking. They've they've already done it before in so many other ways. I don't think it's going to happen like right away. But, you know, if 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 we're breaking it down by generations, if this is the last like physical Xbox generation, mm. I wouldn't you know, if, if if I came through a time machine and told myself that I wouldn't like not believe it. I mean, that's the yeah. thing. It's like. The the secret fourth thing that we're not really talking about, I guess fifth thing if you include PC, is like the cloud. If that's the Absolutely. that's the future of Xbox, is like they leave the hardware space completely. Like you've already seen that Samsung TVs now, mm -hmm. uh, you can just attach your controller to your phone and you can run things on X Cloud. They leave the hardware space altogether. They still run things like the accessibility controller, the Elite controller, the regular Xbox controller, but you can play everywhere. Like I could play all that stuff on my Mac just streaming. I could absolutely mm. see that route. And, and, you know, given that, what is it, the most, the biggest money-making thing that Windows has, uh, Microsoft has, is um, Azure, the cloud computing yeah. tech. Put Game Pass on uh, Apple Vision Pro. Do it. There are, there are dozens of us. <laughs> it's already on <laughs> MetaQuest 3 headsets. It's on MetaQuest 3 headset right now. Yeah, so, put, it yeah, on, absolutely. put it on the premium one. It put it on the elite one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, Apple actually will do that because just mm -hmm. recently they have changed their rules and they now allow dedicated apps on the App Store for streaming platforms, including GeForce Now and xCloud. So, yes, absolutely. It will appear on the Vision Pro uh, for sure. So, yeah, I don't know. It's um, it's really nerve wracking. I'll tell you what I'm thinking about as well. Like, I, I feel like if Microsoft and I know we're all talking about hypotheticals here where we don't know. We don't know. We're just we're just talking. We're just talking. We're just asking questions. OK. <laughs> But let's say hypothetically Microsoft does become a third party focused publisher uh, who also has a little bit of hardware stuff going on. They try and maintain their platforms across, you know, X xCloud and Game Pass and all this sort of stuff. Right. But they're a third party business. How does that affect the kind of games that they want to make? Because, I mean, third party games, a lot of the time, like the first party system sellers that we buy are typically single player focused very big bet triple a games that are just they're swinging for the fences you know what i mean because they're like this game needs to rock so that people want to buy this game buy the console to play this game third party games a lot of the time not all the time but a lot of the time especially from bigger entities they're focused on live services they're focused on right. microtransactions you know what i mean and if you shift if microsoft becomes an entity that is focused on third party publishing I think it's going to be less focused on box sales and more focused on long tail live service revenue. And I wonder if they're going to have the same commitment to making these weird little like Psychonauts 2 and Hellblade. Like, is that publisher who's a third party focused publisher backing those bets at this point? I don't know about that, man. I would probably guess not. If this is a dollars and cents business decision, I don't imagine Psychonauts made a lot of money for Xbox or Hi-Fi Rush for that matter. So I think it really, that's what I worry about with all this. If this happens, sure, you can, Halo will still exist. And Halo kind of went with the free to play stuff, or whatever, probably a bad example. But I don't know. I just, I wonder if they'll walk away from that commitment of saying we are going to make fantastic system selling games. But see that, um, that, goes against what their messaging has been over mm. X amount of years, right? Uh, talking about bringing these quality experiences. This is why they were doing certain acquisitions that they did, like Double Fine, like you bring up Psychonauts 2 as an example. I don't think Double Fine is ever meant to deliver a game that's going to sell 20 million copies, but it's going to sure. give you something that's critically acclaimed, something that you can sure. hold up high and talk about. My, my thing when I think about this is, 
it would seem to me, and again, I'm not clearly not smart enough to be in these rooms to make these decisions, but it would seem to me that they would want to keep a hand on the wheel when it when it comes to hardware so they can kind of dictate what what hardware is doing so if if there's certain innovations and things that they want to be able to do with their games but but to lucy's point maybe it's maybe it's cloud i don't know maybe it's cloud and ai that that's the direction that they're going to go to continue to deliver yeah. certain innovations on games but but to your point I mean, if they were to just go completely third party, they are now at the mercy of whatever Nintendo is going to do, whatever PlayStation is going mm. to do from a hardware standpoint. And that is going to dictate what their games are going to look like moving forward. So they, they, they kind of got to a- answer these questions. Um, maybe they'll start answering them somewhat next week. I, I would hope, knock on wood, that they would actually be up to doing some some interviews so people can ask these questions and try and get some definitive answers and clarity on that. But mm. what I've seen over the past 48, 72 hours is that concern that the games that we thought we were going to be getting from Xbox, you know, with, with all these acquisitions and the things that they've already announced, like a Clockwork Revolution, the South of Midnight, are you going to continue to have that commitment towards those versus just being another Sega? Because, I mean, that's kind of the word around the campfire. Yeah. They're just going to be Sega, not make hardware anymore and just make third party games. And I wanted to ask you, because, I mean, you're quite juiced into the Xbox community <laughs> and it's it's like it's a thing, the Xbox community. Yeah. Like it's a thing, right? And I wanted to get, because I was also listening in on a Twitter spaces that you were in. I saw it. I, I logged on to Twitter. <laughs> there was a big Twitter spaces and there was a lot said in that Twitter really space, that. my man. It was a lot said. So, um, but I think it was a very, it was fascinating to listen to because it was very raw reactions from right. uh, very rusted on hardcore Xbox fans who, you know, Xbox is a big part of their personal identity. You know what I mean? In terms of the brands they've built, the games they've played, the friends they've made, whatever else. So I wanted maybe just get your view on, like what was that reaction that you are seeing across the community panic you know how you panic <laughs> it's panic yeah. it, it's panic and it's funny you say it like i'll go into those community spaces i, I think i get myself in trouble doing that sometimes <laughs> but i try I try to go in there and, and at least provide a perspective that maybe they're not having like hey here's what i think is going on but a lot of what i i've been seeing over the weekend with from people from the community is Again, it comes back to that brand loyalty. Like, I am a fan of Xbox. Are you losing the identity of everything that I liked about Xbox? Right. It, do I have to now go get a PlayStation? Can I, am I no longer going to have, you know, an Xbox uh, console under my television? Is Game Pass going away? Like, are, am I still going to have achievements now for, mm-hmm. for, for my games? Are you just stripping all that out and you're just going to simply make games moving forward? So. Again, th- this is why, and I know I had kind of DM'd you this a little bit before before we started, that I was saying part of the problem with Xbox, and it has been for a very long time, has been their communication and their messaging. They've always been very reactive to bad news instead of getting in front of it and kind of dictating what the message is going to be. Like, again, these rumors have really been floating around since December, And here we are in February now. And really the only reason that we're seeing a response to it is because it got to the level of a Tom Warren or a Jeff Grubb actually starting to report these things now versus, hey, let's get out in front of it. Yes, we are going to make some business changes. Yes, we are going to talk about it. Just be patient. If they would have come out ahead of this and said that, maybe we don't see all these flood of leaks that have come out. And who knows how many of them are true or not. But the community is taking every last rumor that's been said as a 100 percent fact that it's happening. And that's part of the problem. It's interesting, though. Yeah, I think part of it is really fascinating because it's like Xbox fans, as soon as they get a whiff of the rumors, they're like, oh, this is it. Yeah. What does that say about the state of everything uh, with their communication in the past and just how they have been performing that fans are quick to hear a w- rumor and, and go with it. And almost right. a, a lot of, I've heard a lot of Xbox fans now talking tough on like, Hey, Xbox does have to step it up. They do have to change their message messaging and stuff like that. So to me, like I see a lot of the reaction as, you know, a direct response to how things have been going. Like this yeah. was almost like something that was coming to a head anyway, even if there weren't mm. rumors and reports. And and then there's the whole other side of it where like, I know like people talk about how some Xbox fans get like toxic and crazy about it. But, you know, from the perspective of like, if you're just a customer and you bought 
one console and you've bought one mm. console for so long, you have invested in that ecosystem. You do mm -hmm. have a game library on that system. You do have, uh, like Paris, you mentioned before, like achievements. If you've been building achievements in the, since the Xbox 360 era, <laughs> which yeah. I have, uh, like that, is, that <laughs> is like a lot to digest over the course of a, yeah. a long weekend. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I think one, yeah, I mean, one, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. No, no, no. We're, we're all podcasters. I talk too much. But <laughs> one, one other aspect of that that I've heard a lot is the digital library, is digital preservation. Like, are my, the, the ecosystem that I've invested in with all these digital games, if you're going to stop making hardware, is that going to translate over to whatever the next platform is going to be? Am I going to be able to keep these games? And clearly, Xbox is headed towards an all digital future. So I think they the community wants to hear some reassurances when it comes to that as well. And I, I do, too. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that all the digital games that I have that I'm not stuck just having them on a Series S or an X, whatever the next thing's going to be, they're going to follow me wherever I go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also coming back to what Jake said, like, you know, this whole thing kind of coming to a head after a while based upon sales and, and based upon, you know, market share and the third place thing and whatever. I, I don't know if it is true. It, it also feels a little bit sad in a way yeah. because it's like Xbox started this generation so strong, right? I mean, every foot correct Phil strategy was, I think, a great strategy where they were investing in, you know, they were they were they were buying up studios because they wanted to make really great games. And they were also committed to play anywhere like PC parody and X Cloud. And I think that's cool and I like that. Mm -hmm. And they had, you know, a really strong console. They didn't compromise at all on hardware capabilities. And they had the Series S as an entry point to get you into the ecosystem and off you go. And that had its downsides as well in terms of, you know, maybe acting as a bit of a throttle on terms of in terms of game development. That's been well documented across specific games. Not a lot, but a few. But overall, I looked at Xbox and thought, man, hell yeah, this is this is it right now. Like this is what else would you want? Nothing, right? And it it almost feels like if this if that didn't work, and now we're at the point where Xbox is like, it didn't work, guys. We're still third place, and we've got to make this. It just that's a, that's a bit sad, and it makes me yeah, I'd be disappointed for Xbox for to not for to have not found more success with that strategy because I do think it was a good strategy and I do ultimately think as well that it would be the end of Phil Spencer's leadership or at least you know um he, he was always it, it was very clear that Sarah Bond is being positioned as the heir apparent it was clear that she would be moving up at some point anyway but it does make sense that if Microsoft are going to Xbox are going to pursue a whole new strategy that would also have some new leadership you know and um, it would make me very sad to see Phil leave the gig because I personally really like Phil Spencer. I mean, obviously, all leaders have their pros and cons and whatever at the corporate level. But I think he's been a very good ambassador for Xbox and a good leader of that business. And it would be a bit of a shame to to see him move on. Well, yeah, I think as well the amount of course I, correction. I oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, like, to your point about how they came into this generation after the sheer amount of course correction they had to do and damage yeah. um correction they had to do from the xbox one the 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 metric years because totally. think about just how far behind they were lagging um to the ps4 and some of that was exclusive some of that was price point some of that was the weird not uh, that's the thing it wasn't even if you think about it now the amount that they invested in tv multimedia all-in-one experiences and like that's what everything is now everything needs to be but they were a little too far ahead and then yeah coming into this generation i think you're right i think the way that they were positioning themselves and i think the way that they've i think the way that they've communicated with fans this generation around being more personable having phil kind of being the relatable not relatable but you know like the face like the guy you, he is though you know I mean? he's, he's, he's way more relatable yeah. than than Jim Ryan. Yeah, I mean, he's <laughs> still not, not, nothing against Jim, but I mean, like you know, it's that's a fact. You know, having someone who is a gamer and who'll tweet out that he's playing Vampire Survivors or whatever. I think all of that is very clever, and I don't want to say the word calculated, but I think I am just saying the word calculated. But at the end of the day, it sure. is a business decision. Sure. It is very much how sure. Taylor Swift operates, and not to compare, but like. <laughs> Are you but no, saying no, no, I say bad that. things I say, about Tay Tay right now? You better watch yourself. I'm not yourself, saying bad things okay? about Taylor. I think I think she's just very clever and calculated in how she has a public image and how she chooses to engage with her fans. And I think one of the things that she did, and this is a very long-winded analogy, but I think Xbox has also done it. Whereas, like, 
that relatability, that promise of maybe she'll interact with you, maybe she'll do something. I think Xbox has done something very, very similar in how they communicate with their fan base and how they are always listening. You know, like they have the creator dinners and stuff that, you know, we've all been invited to where they have like creators and press will actually get FaceTime with Phil Spencer. Like Sony doesn't do that. Yeah, like, Sony and Nintendo do Nintendo not, do not no. operate that Don't way. Don't do that. So, so I mean... Nintendo doesn't even know that anyone outside the new headquarters exists. <laughs> they just don't understand that concept. You know what I mean? So, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely yeah. right. And, like, but, and sure. Taylor used to have album listening parties at her house where she'd have yeah, fans come around. And see that it's all, it- this is the thumbnail. It's a picture of Taylor Swift <laughs> next to Phil Spencer. And we'll yeah, be like, the Taylor really Swift effect. Let's yeah. capitalize on that. Let's do it. <laughs> that actually was clickable. Yeah. I like right? that. But it's you good. See, so you see what I mean? It is part of a thing where it's like, Yes, it's personable, and yes, they of course corrected in a in a brilliant way based on where they were from the last generation. But the same day, the same thing, even it is a business. Yeah, and for sure. Absolutely. I think a lot of people, especially given the reaction online, are forgetting that, or at least not forgetting that, but definitely not considering that when they are getting so upset and like. You are well within your right to be upset about something. I think it's fantastic to be a fan of something, be so passionate about things. But when you are, I mean, already seen it, like my, one of my friends has been getting death threats just because they work at Xbox. And that is so bizarre. Like if you are sending death threats to people because a game might come out on a different platform than the one that you own, dude. That's very grow up. weird. Pack it up. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you guys something because one thing that, Phil Spencer said during your kind of funny interview, by the way, Paris, by the way, amazing interview. You guys absolutely crushed that <laughs> oh, one. Oh, thank you. Um, he said, and I, I'm paraphrasing. Sorry for context, it was something this is the, the one after Redfall, so, right? Yeah. After Redfall, mm-hmm. after Redfall, that's right. And that was when Phil was, he was very down and he was very open and more open than I think we've ever seen any video game boss ever in in any recorded media. Um, and he basically said, this is where he said like, oh, we were third place and whatever else. And he also said something along the lines of, you know, people just say, oh, if we just release great games it will turn things around. And I'm paraphrasing, but it was something to that effect. And he kind of, he basically was trying to say, he wasn't saying great games don't matter, but he was saying that all of the systemic restrictions that are currently imposed by their third place position means that they, if they just release good games, it's not enough to move the needle. And I wanted to ask you guys what you thought about that in this context. Do you agree with him? Do you I, reckon? I, I obviously remember that interview very well. And, sure. and I know what you're talking about in that context, because he also added in there, it wouldn't matter if Starfield was an 11 out of 10 when he was talking yeah. about that. But the point that he was making was they lost the last generation, which was the start of the digital ecosystem. And it's going mm. to be very hard for them. Just releasing great games is not going to be enough for get to get someone to basically abandon all their digital games that they have over here and now jump over here and, and basically start all over because you have great games. But but I will add in this part, which kind of goes back to something you were saying before, that that would be the the sad part of all of this if if this completely disrupts because you could see Xbox building up to this point from 2016 to, to where they are now as far as infrastructure, adding all these services, the game path, all the things that they were doing and that missing piece which both Phil and Matt Booty had been talking about in the last couple of years is the content, the games, where he, even in that interview, he, he mentioned he was like, we're so close, I can see it. And, and, the, and the phrase both of them have repeated is, we want to get to the point where we have a major release every quarter. And even from this dev direct, you could see, wow, we're actually getting to that point now. And then obviously 2025 and beyond, here we go. We're actually getting the games. Everyone's complaining about getting games. You're getting games. And it sounds like even that's not enough. They can't just rely on having great games, thinking that's going to get people to invest into their ecosystem. But this is what I really, I was trying to, I was trying to prodding at, right? Like, have there been... Any really great system selling level games on Xbox this generation? No. Starfield is probably the closest. And that is a real stretch from a variety of perspectives. Obviously, it's sold a lot for sure. But I think... The critical reception to that it's 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 no sky flight obviously. simulator for dads the same. maybe <laughs> dads uh obviously forza rules the category now mm-hmm. in terms of but it's it's its own niche thing um 
Yeah, I mean, I, and I think, and there's obviously there were no system sellers during the Xbox One era. Yeah. yeah I mean, they just, they just weren't full stop, uh, right? So we're talking two, one and a half console generations. And I do not want to pretend as though there are no good Xbox games because I love, you know, like Hi-Fi Rush, incredible. Yeah. Psychonauts 2, incredible. Yeah. And I like, and I'm not even a racing guy and I like Forza and I enjoyed the Halo campaign, didn't love it, right? So I don't want to create this false narrative of like Xbox games is shit. But what I am asking is, has there been a God of War on And that's on the Xbox? point. What's the Has game a, that's going to get you to go, totally. I got to go get an Xbox to play this. That's and, the thing. And I think, and I just, I really, and I think about what Phil said that time. And I like, and I think about the Nintendo Switch where you're coming off the back of the Wii U, which sold like 13 million units and everyone, absolute catastrophe for Nintendo by every metric, right? And then they just announced this week that the Switch has sold 132 million units and they've sold 1.2 billion games. You know what I mean? And it's like, look at that turnaround. Look at what you've done there. And what what was the basis of that? Was it because they made a handheld console? I mean, yeah, sure. Obviously, that would have helped. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, the games that you could get on that platform were extraordinary. Mm. And they sold... Oh, Zelda has sold... Just just Tears of the Kingdom, 21 million copies. You know Good what I mean? At Lord. full price. And it's like, and it is, it Hogwarts Legacy just edged it out as the top selling game for 2023. But Hogwarts Legacy is available on every platform. Mm. Zelda is on one. You know what I mean? And I really think about how different it might have been if Xbox had managed to pump out one, two, three truly system selling games that uh you just have to have to have an xbox to play or it's on pc or whatever but it just it's that prestige factor it's the sell through on hardware it's all of that and you haven't had that for a long time with xbox and i think that more than anything else is probably why they're in this position where they need to make this sort of pivot it's like to be different to stand out in the market they invested in like paris said from 2016 all this foundational platform building and and ways to be competitive different ways to access games more options and stuff like that but it's it's for me it's it's like they they built the tracks but the train still we're still waiting for some of that train you know we're getting some shipments through like you know like a freight train but like we're waiting for real commuter trains to come through and and by that i mean Mm -hmm. games a bunch of games because Mm -hmm. i i do think that that's the bottom line here like in terms of it is interest conversation you know which keeps a lot of things alive it's Mm. it's games and it's not toxic to say that either i think as well so much of the conversation becomes like well it's you're ignoring xboxes and it's no it's not it's like as i said we all all of us have enjoyed various xbox games when they drop one it's usually on my game of the year list just saying totally you know know what i mean and so it's like it's it's there but it's not (laughs) that extra little step where it's like the Spider-Man 2018, for example, and you, and your God of War, and it's just you, you, your naughty dog stuff, like just that mm. level yeah. of. So with yeah. that, I'm curious yeah. to see with this big business event thing how much of an actual pivot there is going to be. Like, mm. I, I I don't know. I also don't know. I also I also wonder if the conversation is going to change because yes, Sony has had all of those, you know, the God of Wars, the Spider-Man's, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're in for a quiet year for Sony. I mean, oh, absolutely. like we've got what yeah. we've got uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Then what? That's which is third, which, which is, is third which party, also, which is third party, but sure. only on PlayStation. But then you know, I mean, uh, we don't maybe Ghost is is Ghost of Tsushima two possibly this year. I don't know. That's a that, that's possible. I think if there's some they've been working on it and they're going to reveal it at Summer Games and then ship it in October or something. That's possible, but they haven't. There's not been no rumblings to suggest that, and there's nothing else that we know that the major studios are, are working on anytime I mean, soon. Like so, we definitely know yeah. Insomniacs roadmap yeah sadly we do you know, know like, it's on the roadmap it, it yes. would have been factions this year but that that's been cancelled sure. um yeah there isn't anything at least immediately in the pipeline that's big for sony but xbox has kind of come out and kind of put a flag in the ground for 2024 and for yeah. 2025 so i'm interested to see but also i think the timing and how all of this is coming out has soured the community in such a way that i don't think i've ever seen before I agree. like and i, so I, I wonder if that's going to really scupper how i don't i don't think it'll like completely impact sales i don't think you know indiana jones is going to come out and no one buys it or avowed whatever but i think it's really interesting to see especially as you know we just sit and look and 
talk about this stuff all day long. It's interesting. It's wild. I never would have thought this would have happened or come out the way that it did. Because I agree, Paris. I think the messaging has been very, very reactive. But I think with something like this, they would have been working so hard to get it right. And now mm. all of that wind has been knocked out of their sails and they are scrambling. Do you guys reckon it was a, a tactical leak from inside that, you know, someone disagreeing oh, with the strategy? I saw, um, that's the theory. I don't know if it's true I or not. Saw, no one has any source uh, of that. I from but. Wirecutter, formerly Polygon, tweet that. And I was like, that is some, uh, what do you call it? A succession, some succession level shit, shit right there, <laughs> man. That's right. I've had a wild, no, dumb but, theory. Uh, that- go on. It's Here we go. it's Bob Iger or somebody like that who just wakes <laughs> up and he's like, "Wait, Indiana Jones? It's just on Xbox? Wait a what minute, the, give me the phone." And then, That's right? He, call, he calls Jez Corden. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I yeah, I, I think that. But I'm coming but to what you said, Lucy. Just the level of anger that I've seen from the Xbox community. I've never seen anything quite like it. I've, I've seen them be disappointed before, for sure. But like they're really pissed off now, and I've never seen that unanimity, that uniformity of mm. of, of opinion um, like that before from the Xbox community. So, yeah, whatever Phil says, better be good. Yeah. Better be good. Well, oh, yikes! Man. Stay tuned. Any mm. closing comments from anyone on this one? I think the only thing I want to acknowledge too is we're we're in our news world bubble and mm. but like yeah. we see the xbox fans and how they're reacting but the, the one missing ingredient for me always is casual audiences all the other mm. people out there that own xboxes and just play warzone on it or they just play halo <laughs> or they just play you know how are they going to be affected going forward i think honestly microsoft uh, xbox right now is in war rooms talking about how they're going to talk about their business strategy but I think there's a whole other layer beyond us that they are always thinking about, that they have to think about, a huge customer base. Mm. So I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there. That's something I think is always not really talked about enough. So I agree. I agree. I think I also think often on the retail on the retail level, because I, I came up through like uh, EB Games or GameStop, as you guys call it. <clears throat> and I think when I started this console generation, I was very much like, if I was on the shop floor still and, I, and a customer came and said to me, what should I buy? I'm like, it's there's pros and cons, but I would probably buy an Xbox. You know, also go for it. Um, I'd probably buy an Xbox because, you know, Game Pass is so compelling, you know, yeah. and the console hardware is really strong. And, you know, you've also got this cheaper option if you want to go in with just the Series S. And like, I think there was a whole thing there that I was like, you know, there's and, and I said, there's also a lot of you know, very promising games there, or at least they're on the way, you know, I could, I could sort of point to that now halfway through this generation. If this is true, if someone came up to me, like, should I buy an Xbox? I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. Maybe buy a PlayStation and then, you know, just wait a bit longer and then get the games. And mm. I don't know. So I just think on the retail level, I think retail still matters. I really do. You know, I think most people still buy their console at a shop and I think they don't know what they're like, you know, they buy them as gifts or whatever. They take advice from people on the shop floor and I do think I do think in those terms as well about how it how it changes the message. So yeah, yeah, they'll be fine when Grand Theft Auto Six comes out. Yeah, all of this Everyone is going to happen. I gotta buy an Xbox to play Grand Theft Auto or something. <laughs> you reckon they'll think that? <laughs> they'll just be like, "I'll just buy a PlayStation." Or a, I'll, yeah, that's I'll play true. It, on... it does. Oh. It does happen. Uh, like in terms of like video game stores, I feel like I hear it. Yeah. I feel like I hear. Yeah you know clerks behind the counter be like well playstation and i'm like "Mm, you're a little biased sir you shouldn't be but (laughs) yeah it's a reality yeah for sure well paris thank you so much for joining us no Uh, no thank you again i'm a fan so i'm I'm super excited to be here and i I thank you so much for having me come on of course anytime we'll definitely have you back um yeah and we will be right back again with uh someone you might know paris one greg miller because uh, yeah. we're gonna have it's a spicy week boys because we gotta talk about suicide <laughs> squad uh so we're we'll back after a message from this week's sponsor <laughs> peanut butter and jelly bert and ernie a blockbuster movie and a bucket of popcorn my favorite podcast the fall of civilizations <laughs> And recon everyday <laughs> earbuds. <laughs> that was a hard pivot loose no. from the other content of that one. Okay, a very Dude, hard pivot. I'm I like such it. a big fan of this podcast, and they have been working on this ancient Egyptian episode for like eight months, and it came out yesterday. <laughs> and I'm so happy, and I've been listening to it. It's four hours long. I'm having the best time. But nice. anyway. 
There's Are you listening to it on your Raycon wireless earbuds, Lucy? I am. I'm listening Absolutely. to it when I'm out and about and on the go. So this episode is obviously brought to you by Raycon Everyday Earbuds. You've heard us talk about them before. I mean, where do we even begin? Like, we all use them all the time. I was, oh, yes. look, Jake's got them right there. There are go-tos. Always strapped. Um, always strapped. Always strapped in my <laughs> Just have, like some little holster that like, you open up your jacket <laughs> and it's like a, you know what I mean? You pop oh, out the I, earbuds. I tell you one thing, they are really great for like really long podcasts because they have eight hours of playtime with a 32 to hour battery life. Yeah, you do it twice, so and much, you will, Lucy. You so will. So much depressing okay. podcast. It's about the fall of the ancient Egyptian civilization. The fall. The Egyptian yeah, empire depressing. could fall twice before one set of Ray-Ban, Ray 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 run out. That's pretty that's impressive. A good pitch right so. there. I mean, um, yep, yep, yep. But yeah, we've we've talked about them before. They've got tens of thousands of five star reviews. Um, not only do they have a really great and long uh, amount of playtime and battery life, but there's also noise profiles, like sound profiles. You can tap them to pause, which is great because I'm always walking about and then yep. I'm in a big city and I want to make sure that I am paying attention to the road and stuff. So there's also an awareness mode. Um, I use yes. all the features all the you really expect you have here. Uh, wireless charging is really nice. Uh, mm. They pair up nice and easy with Bluetooth. You're good to go. You can take calls. It has a microphone. They, they check all the proper boxes. Mm -hmm. Plus, they do so at a fraction of the cost of premium other premium earbuds. You know, like yeah, they really huge. are a hell of a lot cheaper and the quality is still fantastic. Um, and so I actually own a few pairs just because I was like, well, I'll just buy some extra ones. And so I have like one pair in my gym bag that I use and I have one pair just kind of lying around my house because then I don't ever accidentally go to the gym without a pair of earbuds because I would basically be like, oh, I don't have earbuds at the gym today guess I'll turn around and go home. I'm not going to the gym <laughs> without earbuds because if I have to listen to gym music, no, thank you very much. Well, people so, um, grunting as they lift things. Uh, yeah, is that totally. what the gym is like? I've never been to one. <laughs> <laughs> so annoying when people do it as well. Like, I get it. You're exerting yourself. But come on, man, just relax a bit. Like, it's, it's, it's enough. It's enough. So tune them out with Raycon. Yeah. Yeah. If you head to buyraycon.com slash friends today, you can get 15% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. So that is buyraycon.com slash friends to get 15% off and free shipping. And thank you again to Raycon for sponsoring this episode. Hello, Greg Miller. Did you and Paris Lily deliberately wear the same shirt? Because you're both on this week's episode. We have sat here troubleshooting for 10 minutes and you didn't think to mention that <laughs> you didn't think to mention we were both in the x cash shirt god no darn wait, wait, wait. It. hang on actually what i realized as well and we can keep rolling is this, we didn't intro greg in the last bit because we would have come straight back from a message from the sponsor so we should actually properly intro greg Nah, it's fine. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so <laughs> we're joined Doing right, by Lucy. <laughs> we're joined by Greg Miller from Kind of Funny. Uh, hi, mate. How are you doing? Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. It's been like two weeks since I saw you. Miss I know. You. Too long, Lucy. I too miss long. you too. Too long. I'll see you next week. But uh, we thought we're going to be talking about Suicide Squad. Who better to get on than DC superfan himself? You've written for DC. <laughs> That's true. Have you really? Is that is that a true story? I didn't know that. Yeah, me and Gary Whitta did a Joker story in the 80th anniversary anthology. I did not know that. That is actually yeah. quite sick. Yeah. It was. Cool. It was very, very cool. Definitely a, one of those, you know, how is this my life moments? And especially because sure. Gary did all the work. I really just had one <laughs> lunch where I pitched ideas and then he wrote the whole thing. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Fantastic. Living the dream. I'm not gonna take I'm not gonna take the achievement away from you. You are a published DC author. Oh yeah, I got the byline. It's done. It's cool. Uh the biggest Superman fan that I know. Thank you. I appreciate and, that. It's a truly. Um, and so, yeah, so Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League is finally out, guys. Uh, yeah. How are we feeling? Is this just going to be a dunk <sighs> fest? I don't want it to I be mean, a dunk I fest because there is, I, in the words of Kyle Bosman, the thing that is, like, the thing that has stuck with me forever and ever that Kyle said Go years on. ago in an episode of The Final Bosman is a naught out, even a naught out of 10 game still has value. And I'm not saying that Suicide Squad is a naught out of 10, sure. but it is very much like a, a one out of good. 10? Sorry, is that like American? <laughs> Not no. zero. <laughs> zero. Zero out of ten. <laughs> that is not American. <laughs> but it's kind of it's kind of taught me to try and be a little bit more positive because I think there are moments with Suicide Squad, and we'll definitely get into the the stuff that didn't work about that game. But there were moments, that, and there's a lot of stuff that didn't work in that game, I know. But there were moments that I was genuinely enjoying myself, very much in the flow state as I was playing. And um, you know, despite the UI desperately trying to stop me from being Kill in you. that flow Blind state. you. 
give you permanent eye damage. <laughs> I um I had to stop the Superman boss fight because it genuinely gave me a headache, and I have never had to do that oh, wow. outside of a that game. That fight was so annoying. God, yeah. I hated that. Fucking- anyway, we'll get into that. I'm sure. Um, yeah, no, but I, no, I I totally agree with you, and I think most reviews that are treating it fairly have been very willing to call out its numerous redeeming qualities for sure you know i think anyone who engages this product in good faith cannot but celebrate the production value which is uh, like off the charts it looks incredible Mm -hmm. it has some issues running on high-end pcs whatever that's overall that's how you came out of dc we go we're not gonna (laughs) gonna hold that against this game it is a primarily pc based community here on the shill up channel i think so watch yourself greg okay it's very dangerous territory for you (laughs) well they're too busy Um, rebooting and getting their exes working right now to come hear me so it's fine (laughs) so so it runs pretty well some issues aside it looks extraordinary um, the facial stuff is is wild. Mm-hmm. It's some of the best. Yeah, it's some Stunning. of the best up there with Naughty Dog and Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, voice work top tier as well. There's just no. There are no bad performances. The Metropolis um, they built. I am in love with. It's very pretty. It's really cool. Totally, totally, totally. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things that you can really hang your hat on for this game. And that's setting aside other things that you know are more subjective. As in, everyone agrees that it looks fantastic. When we come to how it plays and all other stuff, people have different opinions. But I do believe that there was pretty broad consensus that there are quite a few things that are really great about this game. Yeah, that's um, fair. Yeah, it, but uh, the problem is all those things get tossed into then becoming just bittersweet. Yeah, right. Yeah, like yeah. I'm right there with you, Jake. Of like, man, does it feel awesome to be in this metropolis? To be in a metropolis built by Rocksteady? To have this beauty? Like when you get to walk in the Daily Planet. And like I'm playing his dead shot and he makes a reference to Steve Lombardi and Ron Troop's desks there. And you go into Clark's office and he's got Mon Pock. It's like, oh, this is so awesome. And when you're in uh, the Batman Museum, right, oh, and they're so filling cool. in the gaps, that they're just telling you the Arkham story, let yeah. alone then. And also, here's how we got to where you are right now. So you understand why the game is taking place the way it's taking place. It's like, yes, this is it. Rock steady. Do this. This is amazing. But then that makes up the two to three percent that isn't just fighting purple guys on rooftops. And it's like mm. that. Then you're out there and you're just like, oh, man, this so isn't it. And not, not only oh, no. is this not what I want, this just isn't enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the drop off after what you've described there with like visiting the Daily Planet, I think after that, I think the game kind of just totally goes off a cliff. It's like it has these moments in the setup where you visit the Hall of Justice and you do the Batman experience and you visit the Daily Planet and all this stuff. And it's just like, wow, man, yeah, cool. Absolutely. This is this is totally on track. But then I don't know what happens after that. It's just they just completely... Well, I know I sort of have a suspicion, which is that you actually need to have a playable game after that. And then the playable <laughs> game is the part of this that's absolutely awful. And so that's why it all just sort of falls in a heap. So... Um, yeah yeah it's 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 brutal i think the moment for me where because i I was definitely way more positive on it starting out in terms of gameplay even actually no i wasn't because i didn't really like the traversal it took me a while to get used to it i'm really contradicting myself with everything but the moment the moment it really went downhill for me was the first escort mission with the truck with lex and i just went oh my god are we doing this in 2024 and then and you will do it again and, and again you'll do and it again. again. And then you'll the end game well. is doing that again. Like, oh but then my they'll God. teleport you to a place where cars don't even exist, and then they'll still make you escort a car. I was like, I'm going yes. crazy. <laughs> That's so true. Uh, it's such uh, a, it's such a. I think messy is the word for it, and I, I spent so long. I know that I shouldn't spend a long time crafting anything on twitter anymore what a because of what that platform has become but i i was so i spent so long thinking about how i would even package up my thoughts about this game because every single moment it felt like it was dragging me in a different direction yeah. and sometimes i would go along with it and i'd be fine with it like there would be so there'd be certain i would actively look forward to cutscenes because yep. of the stuff we talked about I mean, like not playing it yeah the animation yeah. like i think yes the story did not hold strong all the way through. And I think, Ralph, in your video, you really nailed why. I'm not going to dig into that if you want to talk about it. But I think the thing that really that I really enjoyed is, like, despite not being a big fan of the Suicide Squad in terms of its characters, I knew what every one of those characters kind of was, and I knew kind of how they would react to things, and I think they reacted to things appropriately, in, except for some moments where they 
kind of one-off. But like, I love the way that they were reacting to things and I love the way that they would react to each other and play off each other. And that was the stuff I was really excited for. I loved the jokes. I think humor in video games is very, very difficult to do. Mm. I had mm. multiple laugh mm. out loud moments. Like the when Boomerang says, uh, my massive and disappointingly male audience I laughed at that. I felt so that so hard. deeply, man. With, as a man, as a person with a video games YouTube channel, I felt that so deeply. But then there were other bits where it was just like, "Oh, what happened? What happened there? Why am I doing this again? Why the hell is yeah. Penguin here? What's he bringing to this? Why is Why is Poison Ivy a child? What? 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 what, what why? Why is that? <sighs> what happened? It's just and it yeah. was. It's just so weird. And then when you get into and actually, I mean, Ralph and Greg, I want to ask you this question because, uh, Jake, I don't know how much you, you enjoy kind of live action, live action, live service games, but, you know, like Ralph, obviously you started off doing Division stuff. Greg, I lived with you when the Division 2 came out. So and that was a lot of Division. Yeah, and, and Avengers and whatever, and like obviously Destiny as well. I My brain doesn't work like that. I, sure. I see those yeah. things. I see purple guns. I see whatever. And I'm like, oh, no, this isn't for me. What was it that was so bad about what suicide squad did in terms of live service games it immediately turned you guys off as people who i know really enjoy that genre that's a great question loose yeah. uh i mean i'll start for me right it was the fact that none of the loot mattered mm -hmm. you it like you know division i think rains loot on you avengers definitely rained loot on you and so there was the oh well maybe i want to make a build to fight this type of enemy okay i'm doing this i need to go that oh i've been investing in this and maybe i'd use the you know special currency to make it better but i know that i just got this other thing and it's a you know elite drop or whatever blah blah like Suicide Squad, I just did not feel that in any way, shape, or form. Missions end, you get two things. You say, okay, this is better stats. You slap it on, and I wasn't attached to anything because I kept getting assault rifles. I'm usually an assault rifle guy, so I'm getting an assault rifle, and the fact that none of them were special, even at the end of the game, like one of the final missions I did drops a Bizarro assault rifle. And I was like, oh, wow, is this or is this where we're really going to get into making these guns feel special? No, the you know active reload on this just goes backwards instead of forwards. I'm like, mm. oh. <laughs> that's that's stupid i didn't even notice that i critiqued in my review about it somebody in the chat pointed that out i was like oh that's what they did with it that's yeah. how they made this special and not just feel like an ar i finished the game with uh, the pre-order guns right see yeah the pre-order guns were ridiculously overpowered it's so stupid when games do that they're like we're gonna sell you a gun that breaks the entire loot system during your campaign and mm. it's like also they okay, make great, things fantastic. flash on screen when you're starting the game you're like i don't know what's happening why are there skulls <laughs> everywhere what the fuck yeah yeah and 777 everywhere yeah. did you guys see all the slot machine there why does that keep popping that? up yeah i think it was the grenade it was the grenade. there was so many um, things to I, read and i was like see i I um I actually disagree with what you said, Greg, sure. about the loot not mattering, ma mattering, because I do think it does. And I think one of the things I kind of liked about, or at least respected about the game, is that the itemization is there, I think. There are some modifiers that kick in at the back end that open up different play styles. And I've definitely seen certain builds that fo so focus on certain things propped up exclusively by itemization. Well, it's the talent trees help as well, right? But similar to your point... Even though you can do that, it doesn't actually, to me, feel impactful or satisfying exactly. to build those things, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you've got stats and you've got modifiers. But I, for me personally, because the core combat is so bad, it's so repetitive, because the guns themselves don't have any unique feel to them, because enemy, there's only one type of enemy that you fight in the entire time... I don't actually care if I now have an exclusively grenade focus build versus a sniper build that spreads afflictions versus another build that crazes enemies because it just all feels the same to play regardless. Sure. So I think shoot that him in the legs, get your shields. Okay, yeah. now I've done that, so I can shoot this guy in the head. I okay, it's yeah. oh, it's a car mission. Oh no, the car mission still has me going up and fighting guys behind their purple shields. Yes, yeah. So those parts of it really broke for me and i think as well and i'm sure you would experience this as well greg it's like we've we played so many of these games and you would think like video games are a, are a medium that evolves and there's ideation and improvement over time right not in every aspect but certainly in many sure. many it just feels like with this genre it's the same fucking mistakes every single release like we really did get a very shitty 10 hour long campaign and a non-existent end game with three missions in no word of a lie three mm -hmm. missions that you repeat over and over again it's like how are we still doing this 
14 years after Borderlands came out. Like, what's up with that? That was the thing for me coming home and talking to Jen about it, my wife, and running her through it and explaining it. And I'm like, stop me when you've heard this before. All right. <laughs> yeah, Here's yeah, this yeah, middling yeah, yeah. campaign that's going to be fun, <laughs> but it's not. But it's not. Then you get in this end game, but there's not this one. I'm like, I'm, I'm describing Avengers again, right? Like, how sure. did they not figure this out and stop this yeah. from happening? And I think, you know, another big part of it for me uh, was the fact that, like, we talked about Metropolis being beautiful and having these cool things and da da da. It is such a bore to traverse. Like they, oh, they go out of their way to give you these heroes and make up stories and okay, well, he's using the speed force and you've got a jet pack and Harley's got the, but like none of these are a blast. None of these were a lot of fun. And even they're, they're dropping you where you can only fast travel to the hall of justice, but it's down in the, you know, the bottom right corner. So it's not even helpful. It's not central. So you can travel there, but you still got to go all the way over there. So you're just going and flying and gliding and, and whatever. And you're passing boring enemy that's popping in in front of your eyes after a boring sure. enemy, not engaging with them. And it was just like, wow, like this feels so sterile. And it, even though there's mm. things in it, it feels empty. You know, I kept comparing yep. it to the Division 2, which I adore. And it was the fact that, you know, Division 2, you leave the base of operations and you're right in the thick of it. And so do you want to engage? Do you want to stealth around you? Are you going to go for that cache over there? This hot drop over there? Something else is happening that's organic in that minute. Like, oh man, and you're boots on the ground. So you have to, you know, route yourself through where you want to go and pick and choose. Mm -hmm. Whereas this was like, okay, I am not being adequately rewarded. I feel for anything I do. The combat is not engaging and not fun the way I found Avengers combat to be fun. So it was totally up into the sky, go that way to the main objective. And at that point it's like, well, why am I not playing a linear super superhero game? A just linear, linear first person, I'm sorry, a single player uh, mission that I'm just going through and doing over and over again. And when yeah, you're not playing yeah. with your friends and you're still being insulted by getting, Oh man, Deadshot was the number one hero in the slow mo thing. And I'm like, stop, like, stop. <laughs> like, well, did you not think people would play this? alone like come on yeah i and i think as well like to your point about avengers it's such an interesting parallel because i think a lot of people are oh how how could you score this lower than avengers that's ridiculous right i'm like mm, not really i don't think because yeah. avengers for all its problems and it had a lot of course the core combat of that game was excellent like the core character kits were actually based on the heroes that mm. they were based on which yes. is a novel idea oh, you wow. know if only and if only <laughs> if only and then and then after that you actually had some very smartly designed combat systems that had a lot of legs and that i really think could have seen that if 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 square enix had managed and crystal dynamics had managed to build out that game properly i reckon that game could have had a future i really do believe that you know and i said as much in my initial review of it and i'm like look this sucks right now but it's got some good things that give it a good future and i'm looking forward to that future that never materialized yeah. but with this i'm like no the core gameplay is bad and i do not see how this lives as a live service like i just i can't see how this has yeah it's to, it's to go the distance. almost the opposite of avengers right where like yep. you know you get to the yes. end game here for suicide squad and it's like are we spoiling stuff or not well, does anybody care what are we doing i mean let's like not do because i'm sure there's some a lot of drops coming combine. there's a whole bunch of things we yeah. got to do and like you know we already know that there's the joker elseworlds and there's yes. probably going to be more elseworlds like that here are these characters we're promising and hinting at one's already kind of leaked because of an audio bug and it's like okay and it's like yeah okay like i deleted it off my playstation right like i the joker <laughs> yes. i don't i don't i'm not gonna want to come back and play this whereas avengers was i would have gladly come back and played but they just couldn't get it together yeah, hawkeye who was supposed to be the next or Kate bishop who was supposed to be you know month two it was what um five months later or whatever it was oh, yeah, and then it was yeah, like yeah, that yeah. drip feed every like you know by the time we got to war for wakanda it was like okay like you over. blew this you mm -hmm. know what i mean but sure. here they're promising that stuff but I don't like your combat. I don't want to come back. And again, to your point, Ralph, like everyone in Suicide Squad feels the same. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like, why yeah. is it that it, Boomerang, Captain Boomerang should be using his boomerangs, right? Like this isn't, is this an outrageous thought that he shouldn't just use that for traversal? King Shark should be a melee shark that's really screwing stuff up. Of course, Deadshot should feel like the assassin and Harley should be this crazy close quarters I'm using melee combat. Like to stop and go, we're going to make all of them gunners. And yeah, you will, you know, King Shark will have the Gatling gun and, you know, he'll have the assault. Yeah. And like, of course, you can swap those out and give them all whatever you want and have. It's like, again, back to the Avengers comparison. It's the idea that like 
at least everybody felt different. When I was playing yeah. Avengers, I loved being Cap and punching the shield back and doing all this stuff. And like, I see my friends, my friend Sean run around and be Thor and I'm like, man, Thor looks great. And you know, Goldfarb was always going to be Kamala. And I was like, oh man, like there's a synergy here where it's just, this is just dump the mm. bullets into them, be done with it. I, you know, there really isn't a strategy back to what we're talking about to complement yeah. Avengers. When you would run into bosses and in the end game stuff they did had, which was few and far between there was like, oh, well, how do you engage this? What are you doing? How are we doing that? You think of a destiny raid, right? What is it here? Mm -hmm. Well, use the counter shot to knock their health bar exposed to these enemies and then just dump bullets into them. Oh, Let's take some man. of the coolest concepts from the Arkham games, apply them to Batman and make them the boring, most boring interactions. I like Still. when I finished the Batman fight, I was furious, not because of the story, not because of what happens, sure. just because of how bad that fight was. Yeah, Every too, fight is too. either, hey, you're in a 360 degree arena where everybody's running around fighting a big guy or you're in a half circle arena fighting a big. It's like, come yeah. on. Like, yeah, this is terrible. all you could think of with these people. And the Batman yeah, yeah. fight and as well, I think, was so disappointing because visually, yeah. it's the coolest one. I'm not going yes. to spoil it if you decide to get that. Visually, it looks really cool. And then it just boils down to you doing... The same thing you do in every fight, Pinky. Like less, to even, be honest. Less, less. You, just... you just point your gun at him and shoot him, yeah. <laughs> and then you jump. Like when the thing comes across, like yeah. yeah. I, and I, I, I know we've been talking a lot. I, we've been talking a lot, Jake. And I wanted to hear your story because you're like mm. very, you know, you're very into like the the, the lore and the stories and the series. So I wanted to hear like your take on the on the story side of things. Like, were there any things that really clicked with you on the story front or was that also just something that you didn't love uh positives for the story were some fun dc fan moments some stuff i don't want to spoil but some characters showing up uh new takes on characters rocksteady's takes on characters some of them just ended up being glorified vendors but i like that they popped mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. and the initial sighting of batman that was shown in teaser trail in the initial trailer like that's not spoiling anything but that initial reveal of batman i think felt very inspired and it felt like yes rocksteady like acknowledging you know yeah we made we made this but now we're doing this and it felt it felt kind of cool uh, mm -hmm. uh but it's it, it's i feel like the game starts strong like presentation cutscenes, and like you're like okay this is this is pretty cool in the first hour or so but as it goes along and once you get to the first boss battle and it just kind of boils down to shoot him with a gun with everybody. It's like, how do we kill Green yeah. Lantern? I don't know. He's powered by will, right? Well, shoot him with a gun enough and he'll lose his will. <laughs> okay, dude. Oh. I mean, it's true in real life as well, so why not there? You know? Scott, you know, you know what? The first hour is good, except for the first 10 minutes. I think tutorial-wise, that was... It was like an extra tutorial. Pretty shocking. Was the one, no, the one like where you, the you take control you of every the... single character and you go yeah, yeah, through yeah. the same area. Yeah, this is how sure. we all got to this one point. I'm like, all right. That's I, right. Yeah. I was playing that and I was like, am I taking crazy pills here? There is no way you could have just done an intro mission in any different kind of way at all. <laughs> yeah, like, sure, sure, sure. And you know, it's an interesting okay. game because I know like some people are like, oh, this isn't what we really wanted from, from Rocksteady. Like make another Arkham game or why didn't you make a Superman game? But like, I think the elevator pitch for this game somewhere is really cool. If you sat me down and you were like, yeah, it's a Suicide Squad game. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Justice League is controlled by Brainiac. Okay, cool. Uh, they got all the bad guys got all the good guys weapons and they're just like flying around and, you know, blasting shit. I'm like, okay, cool. And you get to kill Batman yes awesome uh but it just yeah. it i feel like it didn't make good on any of the and anything it really set up so it, it's the same thing the same problem with me and i'm sorry if you watch my videos and i'm repeating myself but uh gotham knights the whole billing for that was we're gonna kill batman and we're gonna tell a story what it's like for the bat family to get up and learn to fight and live without batman awesome idea love it here for it didn't do anything with it. Then here, Suicide Squad killed the Justice League. It's like, kill the Justice League is huge, man. That is a huge concept. That can be a ton of fun. There's so much you can do with it. And they didn't really commit to that either. It, it, mm. I, I, it's hard to like talk around without spoiling things, but it's like the big part of the game, the game is structured around taking out all the, all the Justice League members, uh, but they're all very unsatisfying mechanically oh. uh from a boss fight standpoint but also story wise story wise i didn't get any impact from gunning yeah. down any of these suckers uh and that they didn't even have like death monologues yeah they just killed over and you're just like 
This is really where, you couldn't even give him a few lines. This to, is where I feel uh, like something's nothing? lost in translation because for me, it felt like they didn't commit to the bit. They it wasn't like Haha, we're edgy and we killed him. It doesn't yeah. really do anything cool. Uh, yes. It doesn't do anything like like a poetic climactic, you know, a speech. It doesn't do anything epic except for like a couple little bits here and there. It just feels like it didn't know tonally or story wise what it even wanted to do with these characters with the kill the justice league concept and that's the Mm -hmm. that's the whole thing but i think ralph you said it in your review where you were like the one emotional moment is when the lasso of truth has been used on flash and he says you have to kill us diana like there's no like even if you killed him why aren't they saying like oh you did the right thing like something to incentivize you you to keep going like or even breadcrumb a way to you know Get go ahead, get the next one. Like here's something yeah. I learned about Brainiac. Story wise, it would have been, I don't know. I every time I finished a boss fight, I was like, oh thank God that's over, because they are just <laughs> they are a miserable accumulation of everything I didn't yeah. like about the gameplay. Greg, obviously you've got you got your team over there, kind of funny, and a lot of them would have played it. Has anyone on the team taken to it? Or have you had conversations with anyone being like, you know what, I really like this. This is this is working for me. Absolutely no one is not. It. I think Andy came around the most from when we played it on launch day, early access launch, and then he went home and played it by himself to get better fidelity and and, and, sure. and be able to there. He came back a little bit more like, okay, the shooting's kind of delivering what I thought it was going to do, and that's cool. Sure. But nobody's made time for it. They've all moved on to better games. And it was funny even for me where, you know, I rolled credits, I think, on Wednesday night, then moved into another review on Thursday. And so then it was like, oh, I need to on Friday. They were like, oh, you got to come on Games Daily, right? And talk about it. I was like, oh, right. Like I had wrapped that game up and never thought about it again. You know, and like even to, yeah. to coming on today, I was driving. like, All right. I had to get back in that headspace of like, let's get Thinking mad again. About it. What, let's talk about like everything this game did wrong and what it made. You know what I mean? And like, again, what a bummer it is. Like, yeah. I, it's just Absolutely. such a bummer as an Arkham fan, as a Rocksteady fan, as a live service fan. I, I've enjoyed so much since my videos have gone live about it, my podcast and stuff. People coming back, quote tweeting, be like, and this, and, and this, but you like Avengers, right, Greg? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I like the most mid superhero game of all time. I can find that much enjoyment in mid games, and I can't find it in this. Like, yeah, I am I the DC guy. I've like, I have what is it? Uh, over 900 hours in DC Universe Online. I should be like, yo, this game ain't great, but I'm in it. I'm in it for everything, sure. and I'm doing. It. And as soon as I was like, what is the end game going to be? And I got the taste, and I was like, cool, no, like oh, no. <laughs> under no. <laughs> And it's like it's it'll be it is so it'll be a fast so, one thing we'll just wrap out the end game thread yeah. though it'll be fascinating if they commit to it and do everything and it has a, a real roadmap and thing if, if when there is the complete edition and maybe there are <laughs> seven new mission types that don't feel like it is right now where it's like open up the toolbox which one are, are you gonna get a b or c for mi- your mission objective like if there yeah. is a through m version of that maybe it isn't so glaring but by then i mean come on whatever goodwill you have will be gone i think it's so fascinating to see the rea- the the reviews for this one because l- like obviously the reviews are almost universally negative or mid right yeah you know i, I think, think the six, most generous 63 score, metacritic i think around, 63 around metacritic there. and whatever else yeah however you're seeing like on steam it's like 84 percent very positive and i'm really surprised by that number because i I don't know. It's 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 un like usually when you get this kind of uniformity of opinion about how a game is, it's sort of reflected on the Steam score, you know. But there's mm. just this massive gap with the way that everyone's talking. Do you think this is like a a bit of a beat up from critics, and we're kind of just out of touch? And you know, this game is actually really popping off for of people, and we're just not feeling it in the right way or what what do you think is going on there what what explains that gap it's absolutely not popping off you can look at the steam concurrence and see that i'm I'm looking at them right now i'm not trying to drag it into the street and beat it i think what you're usually this is the same thing we all see when we do this right and lucy i know you know it from GameSpot so well i know it from ign where you have that early access you're able to get in there da 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 so the people who want to believe are there saying no 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 you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong blah 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 blah. and even though we all got our hands on this one at the same time i still think there's a lot of that where it was you know the comments i see where people are mad at me not liking it there it's always 
yeah, okay, fine. It's middle of the road, but I'm having fun with it. And it's like, sure. well, yeah, yeah, you're allowed to have fun with whatever you want to. I have fun with bad games all the time, but it's like, we still just sit here and put a score on it and talk mm. about what it is and how it stacks up. And, and like, mm. there's that disconnect, I think, between trying to be critical of something and loving it and just loving something. And so I think there mm. is this audience that is just stoked to be in that DC universe is stoked to support Rocksteady, is stoked to have something to grind on and chase and shoot. And so they are like, well, yeah, but every game repeats its mechanics. Every game only has so many <laughs> mission up. types. And I'm like, well, yeah, every games all have a, a game loop, but this one's is, so glaringly dull i think yeah. you know what i mean where it's like yeah, yeah. there's just i think there's people wanting to believe something that they're enjoying again like i'm talking as an avengers fan and avengers i was on the subreddit every day checking in and seeing <laughs> what people were saying like i knew the game wasn't a 10 out of 10 but like mm. i'm there enjoying it and so yeah i was still buying skins or doing this thing or enjoying this thing to a certain degree so those people well, are we, definitely out there. I've definitely spoken to them. Those people that are like, yeah, no, but like, I like, loving it. I like this world. This yeah. is cool. Or like, I've got a lot of like, stop complaining. I'm doing end game with my friends and it's awesome. And yeah. you know, cool. cool. Hey, you I didn't know, know, you didn't know what to expect from this and you're trying to make it into an art. I'm like, I'm not doing either <laughs> no. of those things. I just yeah. wanted yeah, yeah, more yeah, yeah. and I'm not enjoying what I have. Yeah. I also think too, with steam reviews, uh, you know, it, I, I was into the game for the first hour or two. Mm. I was like, mm. all right, cool. Where's this going to go? I'm enjoying the cutscenes, the gameplay. All right. I can't wait for there to be more enemy types and maybe more map <laughs> and mission types. Yes. And then it's just after that, it starts to fizzle out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, it's a shame. Obviously, I think, I think the biggest, so the biggest shame with all this is, that, you know, this is what Rocksteady made, you know, and this is what they worked on for nine years. And yeah. it's frustrating to see that this genre has claimed another studio like this. You know, mm. it's like these fucking games, live service, looters or whatever. They just, they just, it, they're merciless. They just, they fell whichever studio dares tackle them. And, yeah. you know, Rocksteady's the latest casualty of that. And it's a bummer. And we're going to have to wait a really long time for our next Rocksteady game because they're going to have to support this for at least two years because there's all the promise stuff and the whatever else and whatever. Uh, and then they got to work on something else. And, you know, it's probably, I don't know, who knows what they make next. I mean, did they make the live service Harry Potter game after this? Well, no, I was, I was going to say don't that, know. I mean, yeah, Harry Potter probably is the license that will get shoved around because look at the sales for Hogwarts Legacy. I do uh, hope yeah, that Warner Brothers totally. see that, a, hey, a single player game got those numbers. You don't have to mm. shoehorn the live service shit into everything. Come on, Wonder Woman that game. Is, Let's go. Yeah, come on, Wonder Woman game. Like, it's let's not going to happen, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that is absolutely not the lesson that executives no. would take from the sales of Harry, Harry Potter. They would not say we sold a lot of copies. They would say we sold a lot of copies, but it could have had live that's service elements in there, so we would have made even to more Harry money. Potter so gun. that's... Yeah. <laughs> that's right what are we some kind of magician squad uh, yeah I think that's the thing you know live service continues to be a mirage in the desert that so many people stomp to their deaths chasing and by the time you realize oh my god this isn't water it's sand you're too far gone you know if you yeah. talk about the nine years that in between this and Arkham Knight right you're talking about a different industry you're talking about all these Absolutely. different things and I think you know what I, I brought up on one of the shows talking about Suicide Squad was the idea that you know you, we look at Fortnite and the battle pass and the success and every IP and yada 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 and it's that thing where it's like we all remember when Fortnite launched as a completely different game and mm. was failing. Mm. And they're like, hey, we love PUBG, so we're trying this Battle Royale thing. And then it took off, but it was week after week, month after month, season after season to get where it is now. And now you have mm. so many people jumping in, wanting to be Fortnite now without wanting to do the work, lay the foundation, actually find what their audience wants and hone in on it. So instead, they're coming out with half-baked promises saying, this is clearly what you want, right? And no, it's not, let alone the fact that the industry has moved so far from that when you st mm. set off to make that kind of game it's a heartbreaker because again you know even if you wanted to leave it suicide squad kill the justice league i that's fine and that would have been better i think as a single player but i look here and i'm like the fact that they just you know went looked at arkham knight's ending and were like well how can we do this all right here's like the one scene at the end or not not even seen at the end here's the one scene in the batman experience of him shaking superman's hand to explain what happened here right it's like I would have much rather have you undone all the work you did there and the beautiful ending you had to have it be Batman kill the Justice League. And it was mm. that, you know, we pick up and the Justice League's been brainwashed and Batman's the only mm. man standing. And how is he going to stop this? And what's he going to do? And what is the mm. turmoil between it? Right. Like that would have been a smarter move than what they did here, I think. Yeah. 
Sure. Yeah, I've even found myself fantasizing about like, what if it was just a Justice League game where you're just doing crime stuff and it's actual Batman out there and he's taunting you the whole time? Because that was like an interesting and kind of redeeming thing for the game for me that was very creative was that they they committed to having Conroy essentially be the radio chatter. You know, yeah. where yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, where in Arkham Knight and stuff, it was always like you'd hear criminals being like, when's the bet going to show it's up? The bet. Now it's now it's, it's just bet. Conroy just like hamming it up. Did you ever bootlicking. did you ever find him in the open world? Oh, did you ever so I saw him? a video so of it. Cool. I never it's saw so him. Cool. It's that was like the one moment where I'm like, damn, yes. Hell yeah. Like he's, he's literally just standing there staring. You're you like the shooting time. all these purple guys. You're like, it's fucking whatever. And then you just kind of stand there for a second and you kind of look up. And you're like. The fuck is Batman's that? watching. Oh He's God. like, damn, they dropped the rare level SMG. Like, <laughs> Dude, like even uh, even the Nemesis system, but the Nemesis is always Batman. You know? Like yeah. he would Ooh, refer- yeah. reference shit that you've done or I mean like his boss battle could have just been reverse uh Mr. Freeze. Mr. Boss Freeze! Battle. Yeah. Mr. Freeze, one of the best one of the best boss battles in I would go on to argue of all time in, in terms of creative, in terms of forcing you to use every single thing that you've learned to outsmart your opponent. Yeah, there was nothing like that. And, and that's what was heartbreaking, right? Like when you are in the Batman experience and I walked up on the first thing, I'm like, what is on the floor? And it was the bat gel and it exploded and blew me back. I was like, that's awesome. But yeah. now I'm going to see the other side of what it's like yeah. to use these gadgets yeah. on criminals. And then, of course, that's wasted. That's I've never been happened. so hyped to see a, a, an open vent shaft that is human sized. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. A yeah. Vent shaft, dude. Let's he go. was in there, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, man. Yeah. What could have been? Anyway. What could have been? Well, yeah. thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah. We'll get you back really on again. Really great to see you. Thank you again to Greg for joining us for that Suicide Squad chat. I think, have we all uninstalled it now? I was so excited to uninstall it. I know that sounds really brutal, but that sometimes you just, you just, mm. it just, sometimes there's a, there are games on your hard drive and you're like, and you, you're just so relieved when you get to click the uninstall button because you're like, I don't have to play this anymore. But also what I said at the back end of my review is that like, I'm glad I don't have to watch that game anymore because the visual noise i've never felt mm. that before i've never once experienced a game where i like i don't want to watch this anymore but i this was that and so as brutal as it sounds i was very glad to see it removed from my device i devices. will i think i will be the person who goes back and i just want to i'm interested to see what they do with joker sure. just because I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment i guess but sure. i'm it's kind of whack but there was another wacky. leaked character that i think there sounds was. pretty cool i want to oh. see how yeah. he plays can you text me that? Because I don't want to spoil it in case people don't know who it is. But I want to know because Greg mentioned it too. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to a user question. If you have a question for us, hit us up at contact at friendsperspective.com and uh, we can read it out on the show. So this one is from Daniel uh, Vadejo. Hello, folks. Uh, love the podcast. It is the perfect trifecta of gaming personalities. My name is yeah. Danny. And I am, or maybe more like once was, a very avid gamer who used to get so much excitement and joy from new game announcements and releases. Over the last couple of years, after many disappointing releases, this is, you see why I picked this question, (laughs) whether it be from technical problems or lackluster gameplay mechanics or cash grab microtransaction mechanics, Danny names some games here, but I will will keep them (laughs) out of our mouths just in case. Uh, I have been, I have felt burned by so many releases in the past few years it's really destroyed my will and want to try new games despite also playing some fantastic ones how do you deal with feeling burned out on games and disappointing releases i have a formula for this uh i've answered this question before somewhat uh tap out uh as someone who is it's me saying like don't don't visit my place of business but like detach a little bit from the gaming news world I agree. Be a little less plugged in for a while and just naturally stumble into whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. One game, one random game, one game on your backlog, or even go back and replay a couple of those games that you talked about loving from, you know, like the 2000s or so. Uh, that makes a big difference. Uh, just a little yeah. unplugging, a little playing some nostalgia uh, and really just seeking out it. it yeah, cutting through the noise is basically what I'm trying to say. Because mm-hmm. we make a lot of it, I, but ultimately it still comes we, down to yeah. you. And sometimes you'll feel better not knowing about something going into it and not having any preconceived notions or clouded anything. 
uh, and that can that can be worth it. That can help. It sometimes it's just one of those games where you mm-hmm. you go back online and you go, wait, what? Everybody hated that. Well, I liked yeah, it, so yeah, yeah. that helps. That's that's power, in my opinion. I agree. I think some of the best advice that I heard is if you're enjoying a game, never visit its subreddit. <laughs> uh, and, and I guess that could also be extended into never look up the reviews and never mm-hmm. try and track the discourse. Because if you're enjoying something, that is what matters. But simultaneously, if you're not enjoying something, like don't stew too much in that. Don't go out seeking tons of confirmation bias. Don't look at tons of negative reviews that also hate the same thing that you hate because it's just going to get you like in a shitty spiral. And I say that as someone who makes video game reviews for a living, you know what I mean? And uh, and it's my job to watch reviews. You know, I watch other people's reviews as well because they show me different perspectives. And there's some reviewers I really love to watch because I love their insight. And, uh, you know, sometimes if you're just watching too many negative reviews on something, yeah, you do feel even more burned out than if you just played a bad game and moved on, you know? Mm. Um, so, yeah, but but I guess the other thing as well is that I personally have never actually felt that feeling of like, oh, that game really sucked. Now I'm kind of burned out on video games. I've never felt that because for me, there's just so many all the time. And I'm like, I if one sucks, I'm like, that's a bummer. And, I've, and I'm disappointed that that one game sucked but it never dampens my enthusiasm for everything else. And I just go and play something else and I move on to the next thing, you know? So mm. um, don't 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 dwell on the stuff that sucks. Go and find the stuff that doesn't. And, and I think as well, there's like really good subreddits that you can find. Like Patient Gamers, for example, is a really good one. Slash R Patient Gamers. Because they play games well after they've been released. They're totally separate from the discourse zeitgeist. And they're really interested in good games insightful commentary and conversation about what a video game is and you know a lot of people will say hey i finally played bioshock for the first time here's my impressions i loved it and you're like wow it's cool to see someone play bioshock for the first time Mm -hmm. and just put up an honest review without trying to make some think piece video on youtube that's designed to get a million views it's just a genuine reaction to a great game and i then you might want to go and boot up bioshock for yourself either for the first time or play it again and i think that's pretty good for the soul so yeah, that's I like my advice. That. Yeah, I think my advice would also be kind of a, a mashup of the, what you, the two of you just said, whereas don't feel pressured to play something or do something that you don't enjoy. I grew up being a people pleaser and I would do a bunch of stuff just to make other people happy. And I realized that would translate into me doing things that weren't making me happy just because I felt like I needed to do them because I'd spent the money on buying a game where I felt like I had to finish it reality i'm an adu- i'm an adult if i don't like a game I can take it back or i can just stop playing it and i can i think as well as you get older oh my god i just said as you get older but there we go here we go that's it that's it old friends were second over here but you know you kind of realize that your time is precious and there's not any totally. point wasting it on things that are not giving you joy and so i think what is Marie important- Kondo, she had it exactly it. spark that that's joy right. People got mad at her, but she was right. She was right. Yeah, but, but I the think way also- she folds underwear is fucking annoying. I don't like it. It's so annoying. In my drawer, I open up my drawer. I'm like, why are they like this, Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> <If you're listening. laughs> but I think, I think there's also a lot to be gained. She's a lucky woman. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the husband so lucky complaining to find about someone. how his underwear is folded. She fold really, she scored no, big. Actually, I fold it most of the time now because I didn't like. Now it. you say that. <laughs> now go. you say that. Yeah. Really. That damage control. But no, I think there's a lot to be said about. Finding new ways to enjoy things that you already like. I think that I've never heard of that subreddit. That sounds great. What I love it is speed runs. Speed Ooh, running is such a fun, I wouldn't call it a hobby of mine. Watching speed running is not a hobby, but it's something I really love. Um, I talked about GDQ on the last episode, but I've just been watching. Uh, so there's a blindfolded Elden Ring run now. I've seen that. It's so scary. There's uh, a it's run. Terrifying. Uh, there's a guy called Bushy who just does runs where it's like, can I do? Can I beat Elden Ring upside down? Can I beat Elden Ring uh, at minus level seventy nine? Like all my attributes at zero. <laughs> and I just, I just think it's so cool that people can take uh, an am- amphibious, um, like ah, oh, there's amphi- amphibious something. Uh, um, I don't. Know. There's a guy who does it like this in The Sims and Sim City and stuff too. I think it's so cool to find different ways to enjoy a game by not playing it as you are quote supposed to. I love did that you, stuff. Did you see the Baldur's Gate six speed running? No, not yet. Yeah. Oh That's my right. god. There's a t- two minute record, baby, with Lazel. 
two it's the one two minutes two huh? minutes Damn. two minutes that's a fart you can boot from the time you boot up the game to the moment you bed lazelle two minutes so there you impressive. go whole new category so impressive for some men <laughs> for some men <laughs> very impressive <laughs> <laughs> the, the only other thing i would add is a little corny but uh it helps me uh is go to if you have the opportunity and not everybody has this privilege but go to a local video game store or go mm. to a barcade or whatever uh and sure. just kind of immerse yourself in or even a convention you know a retro mm. gaming convention immerse yourself in the the joy of other people if that it's mm-hmm. it sounds weird but even if you're an that's introvert true. just yeah. like breathing some of that air that stinky air but <laughs> breathing some of that air can make a difference or go to a local game store if you have one a mom and pop type store talk to the guy behind the counter like that like it makes you kind of realize like why you were playing and loving this stuff in the first place totally agree i agree yeah. Well, uh, thank you again for your question. Next up, we got an interview with Anthony from the Entrada team. But I wanted to make a joke about the Greek names. You can do that. You're I can do that, that still? right now. I yeah. can still make the joke about Greek names. Okay, cool. we're rolling. <laughs> <laughs> it's Christolakis, right? Yes, it is. Okay, right, nice. Okay, well, I have like a lot of Greeks in my life, so that's why I feel very confident oh, yeah. when I'm presented with a Greek name. I'm like, I know how to pronounce that. I'm feeling good today. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. But Ant- <laughs> Anthony Christolakis, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we are certain that you are just like ridiculously busy right now. You've had a gigantic launch. Um, first of all, right off the top, congratulations. That is, it is huge. Thanks. Um, we'll talk about the specifics of the numbers and whatever a bit later on, but, um, but yeah, we really do appreciate you making the time in what I'm sure is a, is a pretty full on period. Um, but yeah, we w- wanted to start right at the beginning with you personally, maybe cause you know, obviously keen games and, and yourself, you know, most people will not be familiar with you or your studio. So we kind of just wanted to hear like. Who are you and how did it happen? <laughs> you came to work at Keen Games and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, tell us about yourself. Okay, um, yeah, I'm Anthony. Uh, well, I'm also the co-founder of Keen Games, so that's that's how I came, <laughs> came to the company. Um, I'm yeah, personally making games since, I would say, the early 90s uh, um, uh, as, as a job, which was a bit weird back then, uh, in, like coming from Germany. And there is not not much of a games development uh, industry in Germany, uh, at least in that period of time. It was factified that moved to the US because of that. Um, so yeah, we, we started our own studio, um, uh, basically Team Games, the second one uh, we have before uh, we had Neon Studios, uh, which we yeah, sold to a publisher. And then things went wrong, unfortunately, so we had to start again, but um, here we are. So we mainly focused on um, console games. Uh, we started Keen uh, and worked on a lot of work for higher projects. So we did uh, games based on existing IP. So that's also a reason why we as a developer are yeah, like not, not the main thing to feature uh, in those kind of projects. So we work with Ubisoft, Disney, Konami on various kinds of projects and lots of different genres as well. Um, but uh, yeah, the last game uh, we did before I tried it um, was called Portal Lights, um, and that was already in a similar space. Um, it was also having sandbox uh, elements and things like this, so something like a yeah, combination of Minecraft and Zelda-ish elements, mm. um, but mainly aimed at kids. Um, and yeah, so uh, now I'm responsible for yeah, creative direction for, for this game. Um, which basically, yeah, we, we tried to, to take the learnings we had from Portal Lines and uh, try to make uh, a better game, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so far, it looked like uh, we found, found an audience for that, which is great. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm mainly responsible for the design side of things, um, but there's obviously a full team of other people involved in the design of the project. Uh, and, yeah. All the different areas of development so um, yeah I'm, I'm doing this for quite a while but um fortunately we went back to creating original ip now with uh with Centroid, for example yeah right speaking of creative ip with enshrouded what was the first kernel of an idea like how did it all start was it from the start you guys were like let's just make a massive game with all this stuff or was there <laughs> one thing you wanted to do really well what was it yeah, to be honest, uh, the, the idea for the world came uh, a bit earlier. So we thought about uh, like more like an 
action adventure game, but also a while ago. Um, and back then, yeah, we didn't feel we were capable of doing it. Uh, so we actually didn't even put it to any publishers out there. Um, as that was the typical model, um, we went out and had ideas, and then they came back like, oh, how about this IP? Could we work together? Right. And so this sat around for a while, and then we did um, Portal Lights and uh, some other projects. Uh, but Portal Lights was the most recent one. Which was quite successful. Um, uh, we don't own the IP for that one. Um, it's it's uh, owned by Five Hundred Five, but yeah, we still created the game, and uh, that, that found a good success. And already had uh, the combination of several of these elements um, that we felt very good match. And we definitely wanted to specialize more as a studio on on a certain genre. And uh, what we really enjoyed about Portal Lights was yeah, this somewhat mix of different genres already because it has some actual elements. It's uh, sandboxy and you can build and, and be creative. And uh, also great was that we, we had a much more direct connection to a community, like working on the game together beyond release. Like we also went for early access and then um, I kept going from there and seeing what people liked about the game, what not, and uh, then try to shape it into a much better game, hopefully. So... Yeah, we thought like uh, we should make a game that that works much better uh, on that platform, uh, and also is yeah more game we personally would would enjoy. Like uh, there was also a thing in the past we did a lot of work for hire, and was always just talk about uh, yeah, we're not the audience. We're making a game for someone else for the specific IP or something, mm -hmm. and it always feels weird. And um, yeah, so this time we thought more like we should create our own IP that we own and can and make decisions on in the future. We're closer together with the community and actually make a game for ourselves. And I think that hopefully <laughs> worked quite well uh, yeah. so far. Tell me, what do you think it is about like survival games? Your game has blown up. But you're certainly not the, the first survival game to have blown up. And it's almost yeah, like sure. at this point, if you can put a good survival game into the market, <laughs> it's got a very good chance of blowing up, right? So what do you think it is it about? To, yeah. What is it about the survival genre you think that holds so much appeal? Because it just it just seems to be a kind of gravity-defying genre very often. It is. And I mean, that's I, I think the... One thing, and that was also a bit of a critical point in your review, which I think is a fair point, is that it's it's one of these like the, the genre itself is is more focused on on the possibilities you give to the player, like this, this broad array of things to do, and giving the player much more agency. Like I mean, also that that's the core thing that appeals to me personally. That that is really about going out on adventures, basically. Like you're in charge. You have this. Bigger playing field. It depends on the type of game. I mean, in the case of Fortnite, it was smaller islands. But there was also one point we wanted to, to address with Entrada to not have this very mm. level based approach. You really have a lot of possibilities, and you can do a lot of stuff, and you can do it alone. But it's even better if you bring your friends, and that really have the sense on, yeah, living adventures with friends. And it's not just you play through a level or something like you do in other games and it's fine. I mean, it's also exciting and cool to play on channel or something and have a blast. But uh, yeah, you become more of a part of the world in itself. Like as you combine all these elements, like you can build, uh, you can explore, you can fight these kind of things. And I think survival, the, the key thing about survival games is not being harsh to the player. I think that's also some appeal to some people. Uh, and I think, uh, the Soul series has made this more popular again uh, in an action game, for example. Which is, yeah, not specifically a survival game, I would say, but uh, it gets to uh, being, being harsh, overcoming obstacles in a tough way. But I think it's really the, the openness, the combination of, of several genres, like melding it together in an interesting way. And there was also a bit of a tough one, also even internally at our studio, to communicate where we want to go, because typically, especially if you talk to publishers, it's like, what is the key feature? Uh, mm. What is the thing you do best and that we put everything on and, and not to spread out too far? Uh, even if you look at Valheim, we have uh, a game where you can do a lot. I mean, there's Assassin's Creed Valhalla. It's also a Viking themed game. It's open world, has much bigger production values, more polished combat or whatever. But still, it's, it's 
it has a huge uh, popularity because of the sense of adventure and freedom, like going out in a boat together with your friends and mm. someone falls off and uh, you, you have rough, uh, rough weather and everything. And it's just, it just feels very different than, than a streamlined AAA approach to, to, to some people at least. Uh, so, and that's also a good thing for us. I mean, we're a smaller studio. We can't compete with an Elden Ring or something. So we are well aware that our combat isn't as sophisticated. We don't have hundreds of bosses and everything else. We want to enhance that and want to work on this. But I think as the combination looks like it also clicked with, with a lot of people out there, mm -hmm. a lot of things creates a different, a lot like fulfills a different you know, need for people that they miss in other games. They're really more, more streamlined, more focused on, on specific mechanics uh, being mm -hmm. polished. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's interesting because as I've watched the survival genre evolve over time, I've seen it shave away more and more of the laboriousness associated with the genre. Like uh, survival games can be super grindy and super painful and very harsh in terms of their like overall frameworks. I think Enshrouded is much more forgiving, right? And so what? how yes. are you sort of like dialing in that that element of it as you were designing it? Yeah, so that's definitely a tricky thing, and I think it's still a moving target as we yeah will adjust balancing and things and yeah see what the community has to say about it. And obviously, it's also hard to to make a game that is appealing to to a broader audience in general. Like if you don't aim specifically at a at a very hardcore survival audience, and I think there's nothing wrong doing this. I think, for example, Icarus is, is more of a classical survival thing, for example, and it's it's great. Um, but obviously, other people might be drawn away because it feels too tedious or mm. punishment and all things like this. And I think that's the reason why survival was yeah a stronger niche or perceived as that uh, for a longer time, which I think is good is that for a smaller developer as us. Because, uh, yeah, competing, uh, whatever, in the first person shooter space and being competitive there is basically a no no for a small studio. Um, there, there's not a big chance you can, can break into that. Um, but survival is surprisingly popular at the same time as it is still not very triple A uh, yet, at least. I mean, I, I yeah, know that. Totally. I was looking at this, I mean, Blizzard canceled the survival game, which was quite a surprise to us as well. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, they were definitely taking a shot at it, I guess, yeah. uh, to streamline the survival genre. And I think you, you, you also described it as an action adventure first and a survival game second, which might be right looking at it from, from how it's balanced right now. But uh, at least our aim was to be a survival game first and an action adventure second, because yeah, we have the feeling we can't really compete with Zelda Breath of the Wild or yeah. an Elden Ring or things like this, which are super polished, high production value, uh, big theme uh, productions. Mm. And it's really hard for a smaller team to, to directly compete with any of that. Like we don't want to be the next Witcher or something. It's also the reason why we, did. we have lore in the world, but we explicitly said, uh, it should be a post-apocalyptic world, also for the reason that we can't afford to make accounts full of people giving you quests and talking sure. to you and having cutscenes and everything else. For a survival game to work in the first place, you need quite a lot of elements to, to work together, and each one of them needs to be at least good enough uh, to uh, to satisfy uh, that audience. And yeah, we have something like the combination itself needs the character in its own, I think. And I think the building part of our game is probably also something we think is superior to other games. Yeah, Although, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, also, people miss like the building puzzle effect from Valheim, for example, which we yeah, deliberately decided not to not to uh, implement as uh, we wanted to be more creative on that front, like hmm. allow people to build floating castles and stuff. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, right. And so, I mean, obviously, in our conversations, you know, in our conversations, sorry, you have listed a whole bunch of games that you've been, you've looked at at different points. But like, what were the sin? And I think as well, like everyone's like, it's Elden Ring plus Zelda plus Valheim. It's like that, that's the talking point, right? Are there yeah. any other games that we've maybe missed in this conversation that you looked at as a really central point of inspiration for this? I mean, we obviously looked at a lot of game, uh, games in that space. Uh, I mean, I always had a strong love for, for Zelda, uh, like from, from early on, mm. <laughs> like not just Breath of the Wild. Um, Breath of the Wild was 
yeah, I, I was skeptical at first, but playing it was just really excellent. Um, uh, like, yeah, the sense of openness and the sense of exploration was, I think, quite inspirational. Um, uh, I mean, we, we looked at a lot of games with, with combat, and uh, a lot of people draw parallels to, uh, to the Soul series and stuff, and we also obviously looked at that. We have some, some fans of the series, obviously, in house. Um, I think the combat is more leaning towards Breath of the Wild as well on the, the lightness of it. Mm. Um, but we also understand that it's not as tight or we're still working on, on aspects. Also because the problem is multiplayer, so there's more trickiness involved in terms sure. of getting uh, parries to be uh, more tight and stuff like this. Um, but uh, yeah, we try to... to yeah, refine things as well, but there was a stronger inspiration. I mean, we looked at a lot of games like Sekiro and others and then saw what, what kind of elements made them interesting, uh, Monster Hunter and other things. But I wouldn't say we are this game uh, specifically as uh, the, the template for X. Uh, it's always a bit of a, a lot of people on the team have yeah, strong feelings for a certain game or genre and uh, we will always discuss what makes sense for our game, basically, to see what, what elements we want to include or which ones we can leave away. I mean, we obviously had a lot of discussions as well. What do we need or what do we leave away? I mean, we still have a lot. And, and yeah, we can argue if it's too much or not. But, uh, I think, yeah, really for me, uh, it's really the combination of things, uh, less than the individual single part that needs to be the best in its in its class uh, or it's mm. really hard to achieve all of that um yeah which doesn't say i mean we also <laughs> are quite uh aspirational in terms of the quality we still want to reach uh, in basically lots of aspects also to the visual uh the visual and there, there's a lot of room for improvements on a lot of fronts <laughs> yeah still. Well, now with the game being in early access and people playing it, um, we'll get to the sales numbers and stuff like that. But just first, mm -hmm. with people playing it, um, has anything specifically really surprised you with what players are doing? Oh, well, I mean, uh, there's lots of crazy stuff people were doing. I mean, I was expecting people uh, building nice things with the building system. And I was curious because we also had a lot of discussions uh, before we launched, like, how easy it is for people to get into it uh, because it is complex. I mean, we have this multiple thing going on. You can also use props and there's this blueprint stuff to make boxes not as tedious as in Portal Lights or in Minecraft, putting everything block by block, which just puts some people off and they just don't start building at all. Um, like finding the right balance. But at the same time, yeah, we already have people who really dig into that and yeah find combinations of boxes and tiny details results we, we didn't expect. Uh, I just uh, found uh, some some guy who built a nice mansion, which is yeah, just lovely made with every tiny detail inside. Mm. And um, so we definitely have to make some kind of a showcase, some cool stuff people are making. Um, so that's definitely something I was hoping for, but was still surprised. <laughs> uh, and it's just getting started. Uh, obviously, there has crazy glitches, like people jumping on bats and then flying up to the sky and stuff like this. You also sometimes see in other games uh, where we have funny glitches in there. We're trying to patch uh, a good bunch of those. We just, I think, today released. Uh, Don't patch out the bat jumping, though, man. Leave that in. Come on now. <laughs> I, I, I fear it's done for today. But uh, yeah, some videos will be out there forever, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think overall, we are quite happy uh, how smooth it went i mean yeah we're set a lot of fixes and one patch in so that obviously was stuff we needed to fix but um yeah we're already working on the first content update uh, and hopefully this won't take too long because there was also something uh, people are always anxious about is the game dead or something oh, sure. the updates don't come fast enough uh, oh. and yeah i mean obviously there are other projects coming out and it's great for the genre itself but yeah, we need to see that we keep momentum to to keep people engaged or at least remember that we exist uh, when we put out first updates so they, mm. they actually want to come back uh, as and to believe i play games like this it's you play for a while then you consume the content that is there and then basically you wait for another update coming in and then you return to the game it was if it was any good yeah um 
it's it's still early access anyway. I mean, uh, I, I hope people can have a good time like for a relevant amount of hours. Um, certainly, depending on on your place there, but uh, yeah, there's still a good bunch of space on the map we want to fill with with uh, new content as well. Mm, for sure. So, in terms of how large this went, uh, this hit a max concurrent play account of 160,000 people on Steam. And yeah. I think you guys announced that you've already sold over a million units. Yeah, I think it's it's been already a good bunch of around 1.5 million units. 1.5 million uh, units now. Incredible, so, yeah. Um, so that's uh, definitely much better than we would have expected. Or sure. would have, yeah. Um, and on, uh, I think, after the demo and before the demo, we were also quite nervous about how it's going to be perceived, especially as we were still obviously head on into development and a lot of stuff wasn't finished yet. And, um, but yeah, the demo was was a blast already to watch, like mm. watching people actually play the game and totally. not having fun with, with friends was was great. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, having uh, that that kind of success was obviously awesome uh, as it gives us yeah much more resources to uh, to yeah to put into the game. Obviously, I mean we nevertheless uh, wanted to go for early access from the beginning, and we definitely planned on continuing development after launch no matter what even if it would go so well we were determined to, to make it work with it or something but uh yeah having such a success uh, was definitely beyond our expectations and that certainly gives us a lot of yeah things financial backing to, to really support the game uh, mm -hmm. in meaningful ways i think so just i think two weeks before your game launched Another survival game came out, rather yeah. surprisingly. That game was Power World. When you were watching that game go as large as it was, were you like, hey, that's great for the survival genre, more interest in the genre? Or were you like, oh shit, they're totally stealing all our thunder, everyone's going to be sick of survival games by the time we roll around? Or were you neither of those things? Uh, I think we were both, to be yeah. honest. I mean, it's... Uh, obviously, uh, being so close was certainly frightening to some extent. And then uh, some people asked, "Should we move our release date? Uh, does really? it make sense to launch a week after after Power World?" Now, I mean, we didn't see that coming. Obviously, we knew that the project existed, but I'm not sure how how early they announced their actual release date. I think that came quite as a surprise that it mm. launched. Yeah. Um, and that it would take off as strongly also wouldn't have been something I would have imagined. I mean. Definitely seems to be a great game. I still didn't have a chance to play it yet, but that's certainly on my list. Uh, and yeah, it's so far as I've learned, it's, it's not just this novelty mix of having Pokemon in the survival genre, but actually seems to be a compelling game. Mm. Uh, and, I mean, they did another game that was also really quite successful with, with Cryptopia. So uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see what they did there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's obviously good and maybe it even helped us. I don't know. I mean, it certainly didn't help us in terms of the attention on the, on the press side of things because obviously it blew up that extremely like compared to any other game launching recently mm -hmm. um, that it certainly sucked out a lot of the air <laughs> uh, out there in terms of attention. But on the other hand, it did introduce probably a bunch of people to the genre. Yeah. And uh, even if it didn't help us maybe instantly uh, or could even have... I think it introduced more people to, to the survival genre that this can be fun from a gameplay mechanic and the stuff you can do. Um, so I hope uh, it, it strengthens the genre itself and will hopefully also help us in that, that respect. I mean, we were also in talks with the guys doing Nightingale. It's also launching pretty close. Cool. Uh, and I, I'm personally also looking forward to, to playing that one. I also mm. didn't have a chance yet. Um, but it looks cool. And I mean... The more the merrier, I think. Uh, I, I don't see it as a, as a problem that there's another game launching. Obviously, if it's super close, um, it can be <laughs> damaging to you uh, if, if you have a subpar game or something. But I think we were different enough that it didn't hurt us. I mean, to be honest, yeah, no one here at our end expected us to be that successful. Uh, especially in, in that big shadow of power. <laughs> but even without that, nobody would have expected it. So we can't complain about anything. Uh, yeah, so it, it's good that it's, it's opening up to, to more people and that it gets a little more accessible. It was also mm. aimed that you can play the game 
without the strong need to do it adequately at the same time, for example, uh, mm -hmm. playing the game. So we try to hopefully get the UI right so that people can understand what's going on and how you craft stuff and things and getting a bit of a push in terms of what, what you can actually do in the world and such as you're thrown in there and you have no clue what's going on at all, um, which can also be super attractive. But, uh, yeah, so I, I think overall it's it's great that there are more games. Um, same for V Rising, which also yeah. had a, just a different take on the survival genre and was super polished and that was great. Game from my perspective, yeah. Yeah. So what do you think have it is... seen... Oh, sorry, Jay. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Do you want to go ahead? <laughs> well, just connect, connected to that because you just listed yeah. a whole bunch of survival games that you know were all uh, ultimately indie titles. Why do you think it is that the AAA space has not been able to do this? Because obviously we had Blizzard, and they but they just cancelled their thing after six years of work. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, <laughs> you've got this massive genre that blows up all the time that people love, but it's exclusively indie at this point. Why do you think it is AAA developers haven't been willing to tackle this yet? Yeah, I think it, it might be part of. I mean, maybe it's not as big as whatever first person shooters and stuff like this. Um, so there's certainly probably still a good gap there. And I think it's really there was a the world before. Sure, uh, to be sure. Honest. But uh, uh, maybe it was rises. But I think um, uh, it might also be connected to the fact that survival games are this genre mix. And in the very past, if someone said genre mix, <laughs> mm. people moved out uh, as it feels like uh, a weird amalgamation of genres that maybe don't fit that well together or you have to spread your resources too thin. I mean, that's obviously a, a valid concern. Um, so the AAA typically aims for going super polished. I mean, that at least should be the aim. That's certainly also a good aim to go for because people have this special interest of whatever super polished sports game or racing game or whatever it is, and really focusing on that aspect and doing it perfectly well. Um, and survival, yeah, I mean, survival isn't a, a single formula. There are a lot of different games out there, except for the beginning theme of actually surviving and dying a lot. And, and yeah, caring about food and stuff. But yeah, look at it, Valheim. They also yeah toned some some aspects down, and it actually made it more popular, as it seems. Uh, yeah. at that point. Uh, and for sure, there's the concern if you go too far, and maybe maybe we went a bit too far on that end. Um, that you can shave off the many edges, and then uh, you're an action adventure in the end with some survival elements, which are getting more popular. I mean, uh, some some of the world games clearly embrace crafting and other other things mm. now. Is uh, and a lot of games had that uh, suddenly, which wasn't the case uh, all the time, I think. And so, yeah, going broader in terms of features and having this slightly quirky mix. Um, so it wasn't something that bigger publishers were used to producing in a, in a meaningful way. Um, but I could imagine that it's it's probably a matter of time before this happens. So yeah. the Wizard announced their one. Yeah. I mean, we were always nervous about, especially after the success of Valheim, which I think was, was great to see. And we were quite happy to see it being successful because we were going in a similar direction, not the same, obviously, but... Um, probably the most comparable game, I would say, in terms of yeah, this survival a bit lighter on, on several aspects and more of a yeah, embracing. I think they also mentioned being inspired by Zelda or something, uh, if I recall correctly. Yeah, they did. Um, so uh, I think it was great to see that there is an audience out there and being more co-op, less PvP focused, which is also a thing like Ark or Conan and a lot of other games. At least have both, and a lot of them lean more into uh, the the PvP side as well, uh, and having a small server size, I mean, we have 16 players, they, they aim for 10, was also something I wasn't so sure. In Portal Lights, we support a dedicated servers a bit late, and we only had four players, which was obviously very small for a dedicated mm. server, so it really didn't take off at that end. People played multiplayer, like peer-to-peer, -peer, but um, still it was the binarity of players, so it was important for us to have more, but we also weren't sure is that enough like, uh, to, to be competitive with a lot of other games who allow for not bigger numbers and having different groups competing with each other and these kind of dynamics that obviously help with the longevity of our projects and making it also sticky. Um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, it, it worked pretty well for Valheim, so still also for us. 
uh, so so it's cool uh, that that works. Uh, um, so yeah, cool. So uh, we've seen games launch in early access and get success in headlines and stuff, but I don't I don't make games, so I don't really know. Like, what are you guys doing right now? What's the mindset like? Like, are you guys just heads down, not even looking up, still working? Has the plan changed? Like, what what happens? Uh, yeah. So I mean, maybe try to not have a perfect plan for launch because we knew things would be like dominated by fixes in the first place. Not that we knew the game was party or anything. We, we had quite a good feeling with the demo, which worked for, for a lot of people. We knew that performance was an issue back then, um, but we at least addressed that and are still working on, on further improvements. So the, the key thing for us was making sure once we have a, a larger number of players that beta our demo, that the game works well. And secondly, we had some plans for uh, content expansion, but we explicitly said that was also a reason why we didn't release a roadmap. We also did debate about that internally. Should we have a, a year-long roadmap together with the launch? And I was one of the guys pushing back on that because uh, yeah, my expectation is there will be lots of feedback. There will be stuff in there that overlaps well, but there's also probably a lot we just weren't aware of or yeah. not aware enough. And yeah, both is true. I mean, we what we did launch was um, a platform um, to make suggestions uh, that people can also then vote on. Uh, so we can have a, a central place or a more centralized place um, to, to figure out what, what people actually want. I mean, this portal lights, I sifted through Steam reviews and watching forums and everything else, but it was a bit of a manual labor to, to get this, yeah, analyzed in some meaningful way. So this certainly helps. And there are things uh, in that that we didn't expect, like one example, and I think that's the top voted thing was that people um, definitely wanted to have uh, their own personal project progress uh, and yeah. not just group progress, which is understandable. I mean, from the design perspective there, it was like we wanted to make a game that you play together as a group and progress as a group. So if someone finds an NPC that helps you with crafting, everyone should have the benefit of the recipes coming along with this and the new capabilities. But I also understand that people think they, they missed out on the quest going there and mm. being part of this. Um, so yeah, we're definitely working on a solution for that without changing the game on that aspect. I think it's still a valid thing that people want to play a little more asynchronous if necessary. At least it's also the way I, I typically play in those groups uh, because I, I typically have less time and then it's fine that people do something in the meantime without me uh, and the game progresses to some extent. But um, yeah, that, that's one thing that, that was much bigger than anticipated. And certainly something we should we should uh, address. There's other aspects like, for example, weather that is still absent in the game, uh, which is also a typical survival thing. Right now it's always sunny above the, the, the fog, basically above the clouds. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that would certainly enhance the atmosphere and also the gameplay experience uh, to shake up your journey uh, if, if the weather changes and that affects your gameplay as well to some degree. Um, so probably not coming directly is next update but uh, um, those things uh, are definitely on our radar as well and there's a long list i think there are over 700 suggestions already wow. <laughs> being voted on with thousands of votes so uh, definitely a, a long roadmap of things we need to at least evaluate i mean it's not that we say yeah just put everything in on that list <laughs> from top to bottom um but yeah we will definitely consider everything and look at every suggestion and see if it makes sense or how we would implement it in the game if possible or um, yeah if we need to modify the idea to some extent or ask for further clarification uh, with what people really want um so it's, it's really the aim um to to work together with the community during ex early access to polish the thing uh, i think it worked exceptionally well for Baldur's Gate, as it seems i still have played that one as well which is really a shame uh, as i'm really curious about that as a special dragons fanboy but um yeah I, that was really strange for me when it came out into early access as i thought a story driven game why would that be early access why would it play that in early access uh, because i don't want to spoil my experience for that but uh, i was also curious didn't jump in back then 
Um, but it seemed to be working exceptionally well for them, like after I think three years, even early access, which mm. is crazy long uh, for a for a game based on this IP. It probably <laughs> there was a bit of push yeah. from the publishing side and stuff, but uh, it definitely paid off a big time, I think. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, that's all I got, Jake. I'm not sure if there's anything else you wanted to ask. Uh, I mean, I guess talking about early access, how long do you expect the early access period to roughly last? Good question. We don't have a fixed date for that. Uh, I think uh, originally we planned to, to uh, have early access run for maybe around a year, depending on what topics come up. And that certainly will affect the, the schedule. So we didn't have a fixed date for that. Um, we definitely want to do console versions of the game at some point, but yeah, it didn't go, uh, didn't want to go too broad uh, because every update gets more complicated uh, once you move to to several platforms. And yeah, so it also worked well for Portal Knights. Some games stay in early access forever. That's that's not our expectation. Like Seven Days to Die, I think, is still an alpha even. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, it's still still doing fine. I mean, people still still play it and have fun. Um, so it's more of a label thing, I guess, in some cases. But uh, yeah, we don't want to stay there forever. But I think for sure we, we can take the time if necessary. But uh, I think a lot of people are also holding back uh, because games are labeled early access. Um, just, yeah, it feels unfinished. There is a bit of a blank space on our map that we definitely want to fill. And we have plans for that. But especially on the side of polishing features and, and balancing yeah, we have to see how, how that looks like, uh, yeah, given the amount of <laughs> suggestions we already have. Mm. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, Anthony, we want to really thank you for being here today. Um, as I said, we know you're extremely busy, got a lot going on. Um, but also just say again, congratulations, congratulations. Um, you know, you got, you guys have achieved something really amazing, uh, not just in terms of the sales results, but just, you know, having played the game myself, just the amalgamation of genres, it's very ambitious, you know, and it's it's crazy <laughs> it what you guys were able to pull off as a first pass. And um, I'm certainly really excited to see where you guys take it. I know a lot of other people are as well. Um, so yeah, big congrats to that. And a huge thank you for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, thanks for the support from, from all the players and also from you guys, uh, like covering us in, in some ways. And uh, yeah, so we'll continue working hard. I can promise uh, we still do. <laughs> not take money and run or something. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'll uh, speak to you guys soon. I mean, yeah, I have some examples of that as well. Of course, so, of course. Let's not dive into that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, mate. Well, thank you again and uh, all the best. Thanks. Yeah, to do. See you. Bye. <laughs>And we're back uh, with another user questions. This one is from Graham Gilmore. Hey FPS, is there a game that you didn't play or, or you bounced off of because of a highly specific reason? Mine would be Persona 5 Royal. I get weirdly stressed out in bigger urban cities. Since they did such a good job of making you feel like you're moving around a big city, even though it's not a massive open world, it just got to be too much for me to keep playing. Thanks. That is a very specific mm. reason and I kind of love it and I totally get it. Um. What's a specific reason I stopped playing something? Most of the time, it's just because I'm bad at it. Yeah. Whatever it is. It's like, I'm like, I suck. This sucks. I'm out. Motion sickness is a big one for me. That is, I mean. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. That's very rough. I think I've only ever experienced that in like Scorn. Remember, remember Scorn? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah with like a really was... narrow field of view, including really narrow tunnels. I never mm -hmm. get motion sickness, but I got it there and I'm like, oh, man, this yeah. is bad. Um, and infamously, that was yeah. the only thing bad about Scorn. <laughs> <laughs> I like Scorn, damn it. A lot of people hated it, yeah, but I thought, I thought it was okay. good. Yeah. It was a good video game. I think GameSpot gave I it a know. four. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't agree with yeah. that score. I didn't, yeah, I didn't that's, play that's... Beyond the Demo, actually. But, um... Sure, sure, sure. Uh, for me personally, I can't think of anything that made like really specific where usually when I stop playing something, it's because a whole bunch of stuff is just not working for me. Mm. Or more likely, it's just because it hasn't grabbed my attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the bigger, I think the bigger one is just, I think I struggle with like JRPGs, for example. Mm. Um, because I find I, I, JRPGs I want to love. I really do. But I find a lot of the time the way the dialogue is written, I just can't get past it because 
it's written in this kind of like very teenage voice. Earnest. Not even earnest. Oh, some, but just... some of it, depending sure, on the sure, game, could be so earnest and you're like, I have to be tapped into this saccharine idealized world sure, otherwise sure, sure. i would completely turn uh, me if it off. was all written like I'm, Ernest, like jim varney Ernest, like Ernest goes <laughs> to school then i'm in dude <laughs> um i yeah for me personally it's just i just look i'm not saying this of all jrpgs of course because some of them are brilliantly written of course but like i just find a lot of them that i boot up the, the, the tone of the writing doesn't click with me and i and they can because they're quite drawn out as well. Like if you were to have this style of writing and it's over and done in like fifteen to twenty hours, I'd be like, okay. But then if it's like if you want to give me like an eighty plus hour experience with this very sort of a lot of the writing can sound quite vacant or facile, mm. and I'm just like, nah, man, you gotta it just has to you have to make this sound more interesting. So I think that's probably one thing that I struggle with quite a bit. Actually, I would say one. It's not a small thing, but it's like it's kind of a big thing. Writing tone in JRPGs, mm. and they definitely pushed me off them in the past. Mm. The only specific thing I can think of, uh, because it is like right, it's it's something for a highly specific reason for me. I can't, I, I can't think of a an example off the top of my head, but uh, a game that on the surface looks nice, maybe like a relaxing or fun or cute game that actually is like brutally difficult. Uh, a lot of times um, I just go, oh, well, no, I don't I don't want that. So I just yeah. skip it. I can't think of an like example right now stuff. off the top like, of my head, but that is a thing. Mm. Like Neo, did off. you play Neo or Wolong? Yeah, I did. Stuff of yeah. At a boss you did fight. play those. Okay, sure, sure. Wow. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, thank you for your question. Yeah, was, uh, that was a tough one. That was you a stumped, tough question. You stumped the gang. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> you did. Uh, well, next up, we've got what we have been playing, other than Suicide Squad, which I think we all put down. Uh, it's Steam Next Fest. So, mm. hooray! Hell I yeah. uh, actually haven't been playing anything since Steam Next Fest started properly. A few demos went live over the weekend. So I played Harold Halibut, Tales of Kinzera, Zhao, and Children of the Sun, those demos that are all that were all up over the weekend. I played Children of the Sun. What would you think? Oh, he's got me. It's good shit, It's huh? good shit. So good shit. Children of the Sun, the elevator pitch is you have a sniper rifle, you shoot the bullet, you control the bullet. Uh, it's, it's. I mean, there will be a lot of comparisons to Super Hot. You control the bullet, and as soon as you hit someone, then you can change the direction of it. And basically what you have to do is scout out the area, see all the cultists, and take them out in one shot. And... Mm -hmm. It scratches the puzzle solving part of my brain. The art style is fucked mm. up in a really yeah, it's cool. gritty way that I really enjoy. Now, how it's got leaderboards. How are, how are you? Is it like, do, are you ricocheting off stuff? Are you doing like tricks? Is yeah, it like no, a puzzle it's, that you're figuring it out? It, no, it's literally just like, imagine you, you're the person with the gun and you're kind of positioning yourself at the start. Like, as you can see the targets in front of you. And then you, you okay, I'm going to shoot from here. And that gives you certain lines of sight. So the first shot goes, and you can't control the bullet while it's in flight. So it goes you and it's going to hit a target. A bit later on. Okay, right. Maybe I didn't get that yeah. far. Right, fair enough, fair enough. But, anyway, but so it's not the like fully thing. You can just basically kind of you nudge bend it. it a little bit. Like wanted sure, a little bit. You can curve the bullet. Wanted. You can <laughs> curve the bullet. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically. And then so when the target, when it hits a target, then it basically becomes a pause and you can kind of just move it around like this and you shoot you choose its next angle and then off it goes and then again so basically the aim is to hit every target because if you miss any target along the way it's a fail and you need to start again right it's that kind of puzzle so it's essentially a puzzle solving game but it's a very actiony and cool feeling puzzle game it's really cool there's a, a certain level in the demo where you can't there is no lines of sight to get every single one because you you basically look down the barrel of the gun you mark every cult member mm. there is no way of getting it directly and i was just i was like oh i was struggling on it and then i realized the name of the level was something like eyes in the sky so i looked up and there are birds and i just thought that's cool can i, mean, I that's sick can i shoot the bird so i shoot the bird and then i have a perfect line of sight to get the other Whoa, people that i missed cool. and it was really cool. Oh, cool and then because i'd done that it gave me some kind of bonus score thing for, um, for i guess doing this bonus objective and i thought that's really cool that, so that's going to nice. change how i look at every single level now but there are yeah there's leaderboards too and so it's very much oh if i just yeah you know, i just sure. do that again go again yeah it's a great demo 
It's a lot of fun. So I've been playing that what one. What about Harold Halibut? I was a little disappointed with it. I don't think it was the best showing of it because so you uh the the basic premise of the story is that a couple hundred years or like yeah, a couple hundred years ago from the point of where the game takes place, uh the earth is basically ripping itself apart. Gee, wonder what that's like. <laughs> the richest people in the world finance off-world exploration. The ship travels for a couple hundred years and eventually finds essentially a golden world, but uh, they can't go there, so they have to be under the water. And uh, the whole the start of the game is kind of talking a little bit about... He plays Harold Halibut, and he's kind of like this guy, this this everyday guy. He just he lives there, right? He works there. And you're kind of... Is he a fish? He's not. He's a guy. He's a real oh, guy. Oh, okay. Wow, totally. I had a different game in my mind. I also <laughs> thought he was going to be a fish. But they, uh, and it's him and he's kind of like a, this a repair guy. Uh, he's a lab assistant, actually. But, you know, you kind of are doing some a little few menial tasks and whatever. And I think at the beginning, because it's so much world building, the writing is very much expository, but not in a way that feels natural. And right. So it's less, oh, how did we get here, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I will tell you everything in this way that you act like you don't know, Harold, even though you have lived here your entire life. And I think that was a bit difficult for me to get to grasps with. It's also this beautiful sort of claymation art style. It looks like something that Leica or someone would make. And so I think there's a lot of cool stuff in there. I will say he moves very, very slowly too. And so as you're kind of going around the ship and you're walking, I was like, all right, my guy. One foot in front of the other. You can do this. <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah. the story is very interesting to me. I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, I had no idea what to expect from that game, I guess. And mm. yeah. It does look great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a bit disappointed to hear that it's not like great across the board, but the visual style looks really mm -hmm. fantastic. So yeah. it's getting a lot of attention as well. Like that's one that I've heard a lot of people chatting about mm -hmm. just because it looks so striking. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. It looks very yeah. different. And the other game I played was Tales of Kenzara Zhao, which yeah. is... Yeah, how is that? It's great. Okay, I, cool. Uh, so this one was announced at the Game Awards. It's from Abu Bakr Salim, who was the voice of... Um, shit, what's his name? In Assassin's Creed Origins. Bayek. Bayek. Bayek, the one that everyone loves. Yes, and okay. he is also in going to be in House of the Dragon. Like, just... Kind of a big deal. He was in Raising Wolves, that HBO show as well. The, the Ridley Scott one. The Ridley yeah. Scott House one. House of Wolves. Raised by Wolves. Oh, Raised by, Raised wolves. by wolves. And so, yeah. yeah, he like big actor and then also just has a game studio too, which is awesome. Interesting. Game was great. I was kind of not worried, but obviously coming off the back of a game like Prince of Persia, where the movement is everything and it just feels so damn good to play it. And mm. I think Tales of Kanzara does that it felt really really good to play it felt very very satisfying uh you are you're a shaman and your your father has died and you basically bargain with this spirit and if you complete this these trials then there's some kind of oh yeah we'll bring your your baba back to you um and so it's kind of this story about grief and and zao talking about the fact that like you know, he's he's also like kind of cocky and he's like, oh, I'll do these trials, no problem. But then every time he kind of comes up against things, um, there's like this really interesting dynamic. And I really enjoy the way that you split between two different combat styles. So one is like the mask of the sun and one is the moon. The moon has these, um, what do you call it, ranged attacks that are on a recharge and the sun is kind of like these fiery attacks. I don't know. It just felt really good. The my one criticism of it is that I feel like the ca the camera is a little too zoomed out, and the world that they've created is really beautiful. And also, I think the character it makes him just like a touch too small, and so that's a weird thing. Because also, I was playing on my TV, and I was like, I would love to be, I'd love to be in there a bit more, you know? Sure. But otherwise, structurally, I think is it is it like a Metroidvania? Kind of. That's the thing. Because the demo was only an hour. I didn't get to a point where it felt like oh, a whole world had opened up and I could, there were a few different branching, like there were a few different pathways and I had to unlock uh, certain abilities to be able to kind of get back. So Metroidvania, I guess, in a way, but I don't know the scale or the scope of it. I did see a boot tweet today that it's like eight to 10 hours um, all in, which I think is a nice length for it. Um, but yeah, I, I literally got to a point where it was like, here and you go to this next big bit. Thank you for playing. 
And so I'm, right. I was interested in this one before. I didn't know how it was going to really be my bag, but I'm really glad I played the demo. I really enjoyed it. Cool. And then there's a bunch yeah, of other I'm... shit coming out on Steam next first. Next first, so I'm yes. like yeah. downloading everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm about to do that. Like yeah. right after we finish this, actually, because I've been I did Suicide Squad. So in terms of what I've been playing this week, all I played was Suicide Squad. Uh, what did I play before that? Actually, because it's been a fortnight, right? And then. I don't remember now. Did I review. I played in Shrouder, but we spoke about that already, mm. and we did the interview with the um, with Anthony. But yeah, after that, it was Suicide Squad. Talked that to death as well, and I'm kind of just had a bit of a break, getting ready for Next Fest, waiting yeah. for it to start. Today, I'm going to download some stuff. I'm really excited, and because uh, we're going to do a video on the channel as well, profiling the best stuff that we're mm. playing. Actually, we're all doing like we're doing it together. So. Aww. Because there's actually four of us now on the Shill Up Squad. Yeah. There's myself and there's Austin, who you guys see, but there's also Stu, who edits the uh, videos, and there's also Edmund, who's mm -hmm. joined to help with the news side of things. So we're all going to be teaming up to kind of divide and conquer Next Fest and playing a bunch of stuff and then combining all of our opinions on the best stuff we've played into one single video. That's fun. Which I'm really yeah. excited about yeah. Um, because, yeah, Next Fest is hard to cover on your own. There's yeah. too much good shit. So being able to cover it up like that's been awesome. Oh. And um, they've already found some fantastic things. So Jake uh, Jake Decker hit me up earlier. So Jake uh, used to edit the show and he said there's a, a game, a demo called Indica which yes. he, and he said fucked he sent up, it man. With, it's super fucked up he sent it to me and he said my catholic school guilt compels me to share it with you yes and he says there's a button that lets you do the sign of the cross and i was like as someone who also went to catholic <laughs> school i'm gonna download that one it's literally like it looks like a survival horror but with nuns that's essentially the, the as first but like, person right it's like oh, yeah, uh, yeah. no it's third person okay. i think is it i think i think it's third person but um it's like if kojima crossed with nuns crossed with survival horror oh my God. and it's fucking weird oh, and just shit. i've only seen the trailer but i'm like yeah. this looks super cool um so yeah that's definitely on my list absolutely lost words also got a sequel which i didn't realize oh okay uh, sure. so it's that I game where that you send the nice notes to each other there's lost yeah, words too yeah. it's called like lo-fi or something so i'm gonna download that one yeah there's oh. a ton of cool stuff and and also before i forget so i used to work with ed when he was at GameSpot. The man used to have a show called Steampunks where he would just find hidden gems on Steam. And so I am nice. so excited for his Steam Next Fest uh, picks because nice. it's got pedigree I didn't even there. know that. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that's, me. so that's me, really. That's all I've been up to. Jake, what have you been playing? Yeah, I've been pretty same boat. Just like, you know, Suicide Squad, Suicide Squad. Uh, but I did play a couple of minutes of something uh, my friend introduced me to. He threw my Steam Deck at me. Uh, Mortal Sin. Uh, it's on Steam. This is a first person uh, dungeon crawler uh, with very chunky uh, stats based combat. And you're, you're going through like procedural areas uh, and it's got a really cool visual style. It almost seems like something the new blood guys would make. It's got oh, a very yeah. like, oh, yeah. lo-fi yeah. type thing. Um, you know, and it's like you're getting randomized loot and you're, you're doing runs and uh it's just kind of cool because it's like a little that's chunky cool. that looks sick and yeah. it's interesting how you can expand on your character so it's like you can have a sword and a shield and it's very much like swing your sword bash your shield kick button kind of like an old pc kind of combat thing uh but then like if you get like a special set of boots your kick can then shoot fireballs so it kind of like tries to make loot a little more interesting in mm -hmm. some cool ways mm -hmm. Uh, and then that coupled with like the weird trippy visual style, I was really into it. I had only done a couple of runs, so I can't speak too much of it yet, but I, I just wanted to throw it out there, put it on your radar. Ralph, I think you might be into it. Um, yeah, it looks sick. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I did play is uh, I fired up Arkham City. I went like Hell right yeah. into Arkham City after <laughs> after Suicide Squad. And I really I, wanted to do that. I mm -hmm. still think Arkham City is, is my favorite. It's the um, best one. You are correct. It is the best one. It's interesting. But I, that's not a minority view. It's like not? I think most people agree no, with that. A lot that. of I people think... say that Asylum is the best, and I went back and replayed them all like a couple of years ago, and I was like, Asylum's so. Asylum's boss fights do not hold up. Yeah. Like they are very 2009, yeah. and the jump between that and yeah, and I say I would say yeah, City is really something else. Like it's mm -hmm. it it's so it, it's so confident in its presentation, like right from the start. Like it knows it's cool. It knows mm -hmm. it gets Batman. Mm -hmm. It knows it's going to give you the goods. It's very 
And I, I felt that at the time too. It's very like brutish. It's very just like, yeah, fuck yeah. Like it just shows yeah. everything. It does everything. Every character just beats the shit out of each other. Um, but it still just feels really cool and unique even to this day. Um, the intro is incredible. Um, the, the variety is really surprising even now, just working Man your back. way through it. And how you're just like all of a sudden thrown into like, oh, now you're, you know, you're 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 chasing down Joker and you're fighting his goons. Then all of a sudden you're dealing with Penguin, but there's like a frozen lake with a shark in it. And then, you know, Poison Ivy shows up like just the pacing of it and how consistently interesting it, it interesting uh, it is it makes it feel really good to play through again. And I'm cruising mm. through it like even Hell quicker yeah. than I expected. And uh, it's making me That's happy. Sick. I wish I had time for that. I would love to. Oh, because as I was playing Suicide Squad, I'm like, damn, man, I wish I had like a free 20 ish hours and I'd go and play a bit of Arkham and then I'd switch over. Because my hot take as well is that night is not as bad as everyone else says. Like, I that's agree. my take. I'm like, I think in terms of, okay, it's got some problems, sure, but from a presentation factor, holy fucking shit. And like, just that city is just remarkable. Like, it's incredible. And I just, I still think that that game got unfairly beaten up mm. uh so yeah i mean i just wish i had a bit of time to not to play through the whole trilogy again but i'd love to just dabble in in each little entry for you know five or six hours but february is not really permitting that so maybe i'll go back and do it later this year yeah yeah it's definitely mm. worth it i mean i have two games i'm supposed to be playing for review right now yeah, and yeah, i just yeah, was like, like i'm that. gonna play arkham city <laughs> like an idiot. <laughs> yeah and then yeah, i complain i'm sure. like i don't have time for anything yeah i'm so oh busy all the time yeah. <laughs> it's the bat anyway <laughs> uh, what have you guys been doing that isn't playing video games we were talking about this actually a little behind the scenes we were prepping to start recording we were like has anyone done anything that's not video games not really, this but I have been watching a lot of the Apple Vision Pro coverage. Mm. Have you guys been all over this or what? I watched, I'm not, I wouldn't say all over it. I watched the okay. Casey Neistat, Neistat, Neistat yeah. Yeah, video. Sure, I watched sure. that one and I've seen yes. Gary Witter were, posted a video of it too. And I watched that and I was like, this looks like a cool thing I will never buy. Yes, it is an extremely look cool looking thing. Um, I really, if you're interested in coverage on it, I really recommend The Verge's review, which is fantastic. Yes. Just like a really top shelf, like it's very rare to find a product review that good, but they really crush it. Um, Mark has Brownlee, of course, mm -hmm. as always. These are great. Uh, but, the podcast and he's done, they do uh, too, also worth listening. Okay, I didn't check that one. Yeah, the Waveform yeah, right, right. podcast, highly sure. recommend. So he basically, yeah, did a bunch of videos on it, really breaking it down. But also the Casey Neistat video, because first of all, because it's been a long time since I watched a Casey video. And, you know, oh, there was that time. It. But he still got it, man. There yeah. was that time we were all watching Casey all the time and he blew up and it was like, damn, man, there's this little like 10 minutes of joy, joy he drops in your lap. Like not everyone loves him, obviously, but I like him. And it's been a while since I've seen his stuff. And when he pops back up in the algorithm or whatever, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's still making stuff. And every time it's so good. And he just brings a very unique perspective, a very wondrous perspective to this product. Because, like, for example, I've got a MetaQuest 3 headset right there. I can't see it now, actually, but it's on my couch. Um, and so a lot of what the Apple Vision Pro can do the MetaQuest 3 headset already does. Not as well, admittedly, but it does, right? And I was kind of experiencing that wonder myself. And you guys remember when I was talking on the yeah. podcast and I was like, this is crazy. Like, what the fuck, man? And I think now we're seeing a lot of other people have that kind of like spatial computing mixed reality awakening as they experience what this thing is. And for me, it's just been very interesting to watch that unfold and just to see this new category begin to blossom because eventually we will all be wearing a little pair of glasses that do this mm. it's it's inescapable it is going to happen there's no question about it it will not be a giant visor it will be like a little set of spectacles like lucy's wearing i was gonna right? say i'm but, wearing um, mine right now exactly <laughs> they help me see um she's she's watching <laughs> youtube videos right now while we're on the podcast um so it's going to happen and it's very it's just really interesting to see one of the first major salvos in mm. that um in that you know that new front 
Um, so yeah, recommend checking it out. Like even if you're not that into tech, go and watch the Casey Neistat video because it's just a great watch. Mm. Uh, the way he walks around New York City wearing this thing and he's on the subway, stands on a subway step, like fucking, you know, replying to a text message in thin air. It's funny. And like he's standing in a donut shop, like eating it and everyone else is kind of looking at him and they think because he's wearing a visor that they can't, that he can't see them watching him. But he can see them because it's a mixed reality thing. But they're all just standing there like, yo, what the fuck is that guy wearing? You know? I really like the guy um, on the subway who said something like, enjoy your adventure. Yeah. That's yeah, true. that's <laughs> right. It was so adorable. <laughs> <laughs> it was so nice. So, yeah, that's what I've been, uh, that's what I've been checking out this mm. week. Jake, what about you? Uh, for my show and tell, uh, I have a film called Past Lives. You may have seen it uh, nominated for things uh, like yes. awards, like Oscars or whatever, Academy Awards. Uh, so I watched it and it is great. I absolutely yeah. recommend it. It is so... Is it Korean? It's Korean? Uh, it is partially Korean. Yeah. Partially, partially Korean. Okay. Characters, yeah, they're, they're from Korea, but it's in New York. So New yeah. York right, so, okay. Yeah. A lot of subtitles. Um, it is such a well-written thing it is such a simple movie uh there are like three characters and i was hanging on to every single word that every person was saying in every moment like glued to my chair and it's simple human conversations it's a relationship movie i'm not going to say it's a romantic movie or a drama it is just a relationship movie and i was into it and really enjoying it and then at the end i just cried (laughs) like really like it not not like i you know i'm i'm one to like get emotional when i enjoy things watch things see a great story feel that emotion but it's it's very rare when something comes along that really gut punches you um and i think this movie did that really well And I think if you're the type of person you like talking about writing and dialogue and character stuff, I think this is such a good case study for how you can do that in such a, the whole movie, even the cinematography, everything, the way the movie is put together in such a workmanlike fashion where it is just well-constructed and good with no bullshit. And uh, yeah, just incredible. It's called Past Lives. Uh, The actors in it are excellent. The two leads, they are out of this world. Um, Yeah. It's 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 slow. If you don't, if you just watch Marvel movies, you're gonna hate it. But if you like talkies, then this is this is a talkie for you. Cool. I watched it on a plane, and I oh boy. absolutely bawled, crying. Uh, the person next crying. to you, like, are you okay? <laughs> I, yeah, it's it's wonderful. I think my favorite thing about it is that nothing feels wasted in that movie. Everything has such purpose. And it's such a very simple but beautifully told story, and I really want to see it. That and Poor Things, I really want to see kind of clean up at the Oscars a little bit. But I didn't see oh. Poor Things. Poor Things is great, but I don't want to read any discourse about it. <laughs> like oh, I enjoyed it so those. much. <laughs> I was like, I just want to switch my brain off and just enjoy this movie. Me um, talking about Star Wars. <laughs> exactly. I'm just, I'm just uninterested in hearing what other people want to say about it. But sure. I, uh, the, the movie that I watched, I went to see Six, the musical, which was really cool. I think I've, I've consumed a lot of it because, you know, I, it was really viral a lot on TikTok. And so I kind of knew most of the songs anyway. One thing that I want to say about it that was awesome, that was closed captioning. What? On For a stage a, presentation? Yeah. On a stage? Okay. On the, cool. Off to the side, they had a screen that was just closed captioning the whole show. And I thought that was They've, awesome. That's quite common in opera it's common in oh, japan really? as well you can get yeah, subtitles in japan on stuff yeah. i've never experienced yeah. that that's cool yeah yeah they do an opera because obviously you're singing in mm. another language most of the time and so they just have the subtitles above ah uh, so i don't want to know what they the want to i don't know what they're yeah, saying yeah no, no, that's right you just like want to feel it yeah. like, wow, if they can't make me feel it then i then they're not doing their job yeah. that's right so yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah so i saw that but i also saw the mean girls musical movie I'm so excited. Please tell me. You don't understand how much I love Mean Girls. I'm not even being ironic right here. I love Mean Girls. Tell me, is it good? I had a really good time with it. I had a lot of fun with it. It's very weird because you kind of have to, you can't divorce the original movie because obviously the script is very, very similar. 
Uh, okay. You, I mean, they use all of the iconic lines. There are some. It has the burn book and like. It lots has of the burn stuff, book, yeah. but then there okay. are, there are some changes that just kind of feel weird. Like they don't sing Jingle Bell Rock, for example. They, I think, okay. make a song for the for the musical. Um, a lot of people couldn't get the rights to Jingle Bells. Probably. For that one, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of characters obviously come back, like Tina Fey's character, um, other characters who I'm not going to say that that are in there. Okay. Um, I think in terms of the songs themselves. I feel really bad for Anne Gary Rice because she's clearly not a singer. And it's not that what she has done is bad, but she's up against the girl who played Moana and Renee Rapp. <laughs> and I think Renee, Renee Rapp played Regina on Broadway and like she has a music career anyway. And so I don't think Anne Gary Rice is a bad singer, but I think she's set up against two at least like, incredible like, singers like Russell Crowe like Russell Crowe yes <laughs> it's literally, she got that's late it, that performance no, but you know whatever I think we spoke about it in the past and I think the comment section was like actually that's a certain style of um of, of musical singing that's like it's called pub singing I think they call it I think that was what it was called and they're like it's, it's, a, it's a very respected style I'm like okay fine it's a respected established style of musicals it fucking sucks okay <laughs> Russell Crowe in that movie is bad he is I'm sorry but like no 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 anyway uh, he's like um, um, okay, so wait, is this, movie, and Mia. <laughs> is this movie actually, does it hold, does it, ma- does it sort of honor the legacy? Oh yeah. Or it, it is, is it, uh, it's tribute. It's not sort of like trying to reinvent it, like no. with some sort of, okay, right. It, so it, like the, think... What was that? What was that Selma show or whatever it was? <laughs> like the, what? remember that one that came out, the, the, te- the, the, uh, was it the the Scooby Doo oh. Selma? Oh, Velma. Oh, cartoon that came, Velma, sorry, Velma, Velma, sorry, Velma, sorry, Velma. I thought you were talking so about I don't know. I, it's been a long time since I watched these movies. Um, yeah, right. So it's not that kind of mean spirited reimagining of of the, of no, the source material. No, it, okay. it completely honors the source of material. I mean, Tina Fey wrote it as well. I think the the biggest difference is the way that they have modernized because obviously social media social is so media, much more of a thing. Sure. So they have like a TikTok. Sure. They have. Um, so you know how there's a scene in the movie where Regina the, she, they cut the the boob out of the the shirt and or and sure. something and so like instead of that it's something where she gets her makeup gets ruined and they turn it into a TikTok filter or they will use it on Instagram so they've modernized it in really That's clever ways pretty funny yeah. to be honest <laughs> and so I like it I, I like it. really liked it I had a fun time. Okay. I'd also had half a bottle of wine before I went in and I was with my two 100%. good friends and we were at the Alamo nice. Draft House. So it's like a good vibes kind Did of place to go see movies. The, chur- the churro popcorn. It's so no, good. I, I got the wings, which are pretty good. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah, we had more wine. So I had a fun time. That was nice. nice. That was my one non-video game thing from the last couple of Cool. It's at films per second. Frames? No, nah, man. I was, I was, I was YouTube videos of yeah. nerds <laughs> walking around wearing visors on their face. So I mean, you know, yeah. you guys really brought up the stand at the end. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, we'll be back again in a couple weeks. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you've been leaving comments, rating the show on Spotify or iTunes, we really appreciate it. Um, it thank makes you. me feel better. Thank you. Make it gives me the, it the warm feeling in my tummy. Which I, does which I like um ralph where can people find you right here baby right here right now all right all right all right <laughs> somebody listening uh, on spotify right now is like wait what where? he's in the machine <laughs> skill ups on spotify <laughs> uh, jake what about you uh youtube.com slash jake baldino and catch me on the friday news show and the before you buy videos on game ranks and also yeah. on the friends per second podcast that's, oh that's this <laughs> that's just in this case thing. that wasn't clear yeah. that's right uh i'm on everything at lucy james games you can find me at my day job at GameSpot and giant bomb uh we're doing jojo's bizarre adventure on jeff jeff's bizarre adventure we're back we did cowboy back. bebop nice. and now we're back to jojo which i'm very excited Ooh, about cool 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 um jake take us home tie your shoes and go to bed mm-hmm.